Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. Inner Sanctum Mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall, keeper of the establishment where we offer you a full line of spine-tingling items, the shivery best in murder, suspense, terror. And right now you can sample our latest offering, which has to do with a return from, well, uh, let us say, a return from the beyond. They say that successful people are those who refuse to take no for an answer. They cannot be swayed by reason. They cannot be convinced by the facts. They cannot be moved by logic. They simply will not listen to anyone who says no, not even to the angel of death himself. Barney, I don't want to die. Rest, Barney. rest, darling, rest. I'm so frightened. Don't, don't be, Rachel. I'm doctor says I have to die. Please, please, darling. I'm so afraid to die. Shh, shh, shh. No, don't be afraid. <laughs> darling, even... Even if you die, I, I can bring you back. Barney, what, what are you saying? I'm saying I'll bring you back from the dead, darling. Believe me. I'll bring you back from the dead. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Is the Lady Dead, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Larry Haynes and Joan Loring. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. I have absolutely no scientific proof, but it does seem to me that, in a general way, a great many people have names that appear to harmonize with their personalities. Do we, therefore, unconsciously strive to maintain the image that our names evoke? I presented this thought merely to introduce you to a gentleman named Barney Kruger. I'm sure Barney Kruger creates an image in your mind. 
And I'm willing to wager it's a picture of a down-to-earth, practical, two-fisted guy. And you are absolutely right. Barney Kruger is 32 years old and a self-made millionaire. He made his money by sharp, shrewd thinking, by taking nothing for granted, by digging, probing, investigating. Well, I don't give a rap about the report, Carlson. I want to verify those assets. I want to check bank statements, investigate every officer of that corporation and start with the day he was born. Now, you know how we do things around here. Get on a plane for Chicago, Carlson, and start digging. <sighs> you want to get something done around here, you've got to do it yourself. There's no other way. Uh, Mr. Your... Kruger. Oh, yes, Winters. Your mother's here. My, my mother. Oh. Oh, yes, my mother. Well, I guess, uh, I guess the time has come. Show her in. Yes, sir. Thank you, Winters. Hiya, Mom. Hello. Get your drink. No, thank you. Well, this is a happy surprise. Surprise? Well, I thought you'd be in Europe at least another week, and so when you just called me just before. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I did come back ahead of schedule, didn't I? Barney? Yes, Mom? Well, something seems uh, different. Different? What do you mean different? Oh, I don't know. The apartment just seems different. Uh, did you have anything done? There's, there's a definite air of difference about the place. Oh, good or bad? Well, I, I'm not sure, but I, I, I rather like it. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I like it. Now tell me, dear, how was Europe? Oh, you know, Europe. Oh, honestly, Barney, I'm sure you've lost count of the number of times you've been to Europe in the past ten years. Oh, no, 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 I haven't, Mom. I've gone exactly 85 times. Oh. You can check my secretary. She has all the records. Oh, what's the difference? All you know about Europe covers some airports, hotels, restaurants, some offices, a few mines, a few mills. Mom. You never get to do anything in Europe. I mean, you don't get to do anything... European. Oh, now, look, next time, try something different. Mom, I did do something different this uh-huh. time. Don't tell me. I'll bet you bought a department store instead of a steel factory. Well, not exactly. Now, it doesn't... I got married. Married? Yes, that's right. Oh, well, congratulations, dear. Now, now, where is she? Well, she's right here, Mom. Well, well can I see her? Well, of course you can see her. It's just that I wanted to break the news to you. Oh, myself. Barney, I'm so happy. I, <laughs> but I can't believe it. Well, I, I can hardly believe it myself. Well, now, how long have you known her? Uh, let's see. What's today? Uh, Thursday, huh? Uh, well, it's exactly a week. A week? Yes, and what a week, Mother. And who is she? Rachel. Rachel? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, that's a, that's a lovely name. Uh, Rachel who? Ra- Rachel, uh... Uh, I don't know. Uh, you don't know her last name. Well, I do, I do, I did. But I, but I don't seem to remember, Mother. Well, what's the difference? She's Rachel. She's Rachel Kruger now. Well, how did you meet her? Well, it's, it's like a dream, Mom. It's just like a dream. I know, but you had to meet somewhere. Yes, well, I ran her down. You what? Well, you know, Mother, in England, they drive on the wrong side of the road. Uh, You mean you drove on the wrong side of the road? Well, I don't have any trouble with it while I'm driving straight ahead, Mother. It's when you come to a turn and you have a tendency to swing over to the right. And so we had a little collision. Barney! Yeah, well, well, no one was hurt or even scratched, Mother. But that was how we met. And so I, um, I took her to a garage to get her car fixed and then to dinner while we were waiting. And, uh, it just happened, Mother. We just fell in love. You don't believe it? Oh, I believe it, Barney. Yes, we we both knew it. And there just didn't seem to be any question about our getting married. I, I would have asked you to fly over, Mother, but time suddenly seemed so precious. We, we didn't have a minute to waste. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how happy we are. Oh, now, don't even try. It's, it's, uh, just, uh... Just what? Well, it's... Jeff, this is so unlike you. The fact is, you don't even know this girl. Oh, well, I do know her, Mother. But you don't know her parents, her background. You don't know anything about her. I know everything. Well, for instance, where was she going when your two cars collided? Uh, I never asked her. Uh-huh. That's what I mean. Well, I know everything I want to know, I, It's certainly not the way you do business. This isn't business, Mom. This is love. I never thought I'd hear you talk like that. Well, the same rules don't apply in love. All, all you've got to go on is your heart. 
And if you can't trust that one, you're in trouble, I guess. Well, Barty, look, I am all for it, and I'm all for Rachel. And when can I finally see her? Right now, Mother. You're having dinner with us. But I want to know everything about you, Rachel. Oh, it's impossible to know everything about anyone, even oneself. Are you English? No. Oh, uh, well, where were you raised? It was a very unhappy time. I, I never think about it. Oh, I'm sorry. Are your parents alive? I have none. Oh. Well, what happened? Uh, they were killed. Oh. Was, uh, was it an ac accident? Uh, no. Oh, please forgive me. I'm not trying to pry. I'm, I'm just curious, and it's a natural curiosity. Of course. Oh. What a perfectly magnificent ring. Oh, I had to buy it in a hurry, Mother. I think it's much too large. Angel, that is a diamond. I wear it because it makes Barney happy. Well, I don't think I have ever seen him so happy in his life. It's so easy to make Barney happy. A pity he had to wait so long. Well, my dear, I think you're worth the wait. Now, time I was homeward bound. Oh, well, Mother, must you go? It's so early. Oh, but when you're a guest of a newlywed couple, that's when your welcome wears out. Early. <laughs> Rachel, dear... I'm so happy for you. Thank you. Call me mother. Mother. Listen, why don't you two girls get together, go shopping, have lunch and things? Oh, don't worry, Barney. We'll arrange for all that. I'll call you tomorrow, Rachel. Goodbye, mother. Well, I'll see you to the door, mother. Well, Mom, what do you think? Oh, Barney, Barney. She is just wonderful. <laughs> Yes. Aren't you asleep? I, uh... What is it, honey? It's nothing. Oh, no, 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 it is something. Oh, Barney. I didn't know people could be so happy. <laughs> There's nothing to it. Just fall in love. Barney, now that I know what love is, I want to live. Rachel, what do you say? I want to live. Of course you're going to live. I mean, why shouldn't you? You're so strong. You're so sure of yourself. You fear nothing and no one. Oh, darling, don't let anything happen to me. What do you say? Just hold me. Hold me as if it's the very last time. Darling, what are you saying? Life is so beautiful. I just want to live. Well, you will. You will. Believe me. Yes, my darling. I believe you. Rachel. Hmm. Won't you tell me what you're talking about? Uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. I, I'm just frightened. Of what? Of what? When you want something so badly, you become scared. But you don't have to be scared of anything. I never really wanted to live until I met you. Well, why? How could anybody not want to live? Oh, there are times when... Life can be a terrible thing, and death oh, no, is only... No, 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 no. We're not going to have any more of that kind of talk. Promise? Yes. Oh, Barney. I promise. Barney! What a surprise. Hello, Mother. Uh, would you like something to eat or drink? No, no, I didn't come here for that. Oh, of course not, but every mother has to ask that question. It's part of the franchise. Mom, I'm worried. Why? Well, it has to do with, uh... Rachel. How did you know? I'm worried, too. Oh, why are you worried? It's something in her eyes. What? I don't know. Yes, I see something in her eyes, too, Mother. Something... Something that scares me, and I don't know what it is, either. I think it's a look of fear. Well, what can she be afraid of? We don't know. Actually, we don't know anything about Rachel. We love her, but we know nothing about her. Mom, Rachel is afraid of dying. Is she ill? Oh, the best doctors in the country can find nothing wrong with her. But I think I know what it is. 
What are you saying, Barney? You've heard of people who died of grief. Of course. Well, why can't people also die of happiness? Barney. Mom, Rachel is dying. Something's killing uh, Barney, her. Barney, don't say that. Mom. Uh, I- I'd better answer that. Hello? Mother. Oh, Rachel, dear. What? How are you? Mother, is Barney there? Uh, uh, yes. Yes, dear. I'll, I'll put him on. Barney. Yes, thank you. Rachel. Barney, please. Come home quickly. Quickly. Barney. Darling, why didn't you call the doctor? <laughs> because... Well, I'll phone him this minute. No, no, please. Just hold me. But, Rachel... Don't leave me. Don't leave me for anything. Rachel, you need to be... No, I have everything I need. Everything I want. Right here. Right now. Oh, darling. I want to live so badly. Why, you will. Don't let me go. Don't let me go there, Barney. To that place. Please. Please, Rachel, don't talk like that. If I let go, bring me back. Oh, Rachel. You're so strong, you can do anything. You can do anything. Rachel. Promise. You'll bring me back. But Rachel... Promise. Well, I, I, I... You're different from other people. Barney, you're wonderful. I know, I know there are things you can do. Oh, Barney, promise. Why? Well, I, I promise. And I'll help. I'll try as hard as I can to help. And the two of... We... Two together, we, we can do it. We can bring me back. back. Rachel. Rachel. Your mother is here, sir. Tell her I'll see you later. A Dr. Mallory. Send Dr. Mallory away. He offered to make the arrangements, sir. Arrangements? For the funeral. I'll make the arrangements myself. That's all, Winters. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Winters. Yes, sir. What are we having for dinner? Oh, I, I, I didn't think. I can prepare some sandwiches, sir. Oh, no, no, no. Mrs. Kruger doesn't like sandwiches. Do we have any lamb chops? Yes, sir. Well, I'll have mine rare, as usual, and Mrs. Kruger likes hers medium. Oh, no, sir. Your mother likes hers well done. I'm not talking about my mother. I'm talking about my wife. Your wife? As you know, Winters, there's an exact science to making chops medium. She likes them exactly between rare and well done. But Mrs. Kruger is, uh... Yes, Winters? Mrs. Kruger is what? Uh, nothing, sir. Nothing at all. There may be an exact science to broiling lamb chops, but you must admit there's a fine art to being a rich man's butler. And so Winters departs to instruct the cook to prepare a very special dinner. A dinner for two people, one of whom is alive, the other dead. And we'll be back after dessert when I return with Act Two. Death is always the final answer, and death always has the last word. But not for Barney Kruger. Rachel is dead. There is absolutely no question about that. But evidently, Barney Kruger will not accept it. Before you dismiss Barney Kruger as a psychotic or a kook, remember, this is the same Barney Kruger whose reputation for hard-headed practicality is respected throughout the business community. Mrs. Kruger. Yes, Winters. Is my son... I don't know what to say, Mrs. Kruger. He, uh... He ordered dinner for himself and for, uh... For, for whom? Uh, for her. What are you saying, Winters? Mrs. Kruger, I, I'm very much aware of what I'm saying. But surely he knows. Yes, ma'am, he knows. 
But still, he ordered... I see. Oh, I... I'm not sure of what to do. I was wondering if you had a suggestion. Yes, Winters. Serve the dinner. Barney? Come in, Mother. Sit down. Uh, have you had anything to eat? Oh, yes, yes. Fine. Everything's fine. Well, Winters... Uh, Winters told me Do you want to look at Rachel, Mother? She's even more beautiful than... than, uh... Yes, Barney. Now, we have to make certain arrangements. You know that, don't you? You know, she came into my life so suddenly, Mother. And so suddenly she left it. Barney. I can't believe that. I won't believe it. Barney. The ring. No, no, I won't believe it. You, you, You really don't intend to bury her with the ring. Bury her? Well, yes, Barney. We have to make arrangements. We no, we we won't do any such thing. We'll bury her ourselves. Barney, no one must ever touch her mother except the people who love her. Will you help me? Well, I... just the two of us. We'll see Rachel to her grave. Uh, 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 Barney, now you really shouldn't bury her with a ring. Why not? Because the ring is worth a. That diamond is worth well, a. Yes, lo- I know. Rachel said it herself. It's worth a queen's ransom. Well, it may sound rather hard and unfeeling, but what can that ring mean to her now? Oh, everything, Mother. But I do think... It means... It means that I believe she's still my wife. Yes, of course And she... it means I haven't given up hope. Hope? Of what? Well, as long as she wears that ring, I could... We, we can... Can what? We can bring her back. Bring her back? Yes, Mother, bring her back. Barney, the age of miracles is past. Oh, no, no, it hasn't. It's still here. Barney. You want to see a miracle? You want to see one? Come Barney. Bar- no, 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 Mom, I mean that. Come here. Where, where? Just look. Look in that mirror. Well, why do you want me to look in the mirror? So you can see a miracle. But, uh, I don't you, think... You, you are the miracle, Mother. Are you what, t- what did it say about you in the Sunday paper, Mom? Uh, I, I don't remember. Well, I remember. I memorized it. I was so proud of it. Mrs. Elwood Kruger, the acknowledged social leader of the city, stunningly attractive, impeccably groomed, was hostess at the reception for the senator. Barney, darling, look, I, I don't... You don't want, Mother. You don't remember? You don't remember how it was when I was a little kid? You don't remember that my father was a hopeless drunk? Look, Barney... And how you washed dishes in an all-night hash joint so you could support the three of us? And when he died in a charity ward, you were thankful because it meant one less mouth to feed. Barney, why I you... looked at you, Ma, every day. You were ready to drop dead from exhaustion. And I said, I'm going to make a great lady out of my mother. And when I was five years old, I started selling papers. Barney, this is not what we're... It is, it is, Mom. It is what we're talking about. Who were you, Ma? What were you? You were just a poor girl with no education, no training... Look at what I made possible. I realize, Barney, I Just know. look in the mirror. Look at you now. Stunning, socially prominent Mrs. Elwood Kruger. You eat lunch with senators. You've had dinner at the White House. Now look in the mirror and tell me what you see. A miracle. Winters. Yes, sir? It's very cold in here. But, Mr. Kruger, the thermostat is way up. Well, Mrs. Kruger is feeling chilled. Mrs. Kruger? Yes, and, uh, bring her some of that brandy I brought back from Paris. Eh, uh, sir, may, may I say something? What? I, I, well, there's no other way to say it than to say it. Sir, Mrs. Kruger isn't here. I'm aware of that, Winters. You buried... Her funeral was this afternoon. Yes. Then... Then you have to admit what? What do I have to admit? You have to admit... You have to admit she's dead. Yes, yes, Winters. She's dead. For now. For now? Yes, for now. What is... I'd like to ask you something. Yes, sir. I uh, need a man to work for me without asking a lot of questions who believes in what I tell him. A man who's with me. Do you follow this? Yes, sir. Till now, that man has been you. 
Willis. Yes, sir. So, my question. Is that man still you? Yes, sir. That man is still me. Well, you have to believe with me, Winters. Understand? I, I, I think so, sir. Fine. Bring Mrs. Kruger her brandy. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, will Mrs. Kruger want anything else? I don't think so. Yes, sir. Thanks again. Oh, Rachel. Rachel, I want to help you. I'm trying. I'm trying as hard as I can. Rachel. Rachel. I'm very much concerned, Mr. Kruger. Uh, Mr. Kruger? Hmm? Oh, uh, about what, Carson? Well, the amount of our investment, we're dipping very deeply into reserve capital. Well, that's what reserve capital's for, isn't it? That's why we're getting on a plane for, sh for Chicago to see, see if we... Uh... Yes, yes, go on. To... We're going to Chicago shh, to see if... Shh, shh. Don't talk. No. No, I guess I'm hearing things. Well, now I have all the information you need about Henley. Henley? What, what do you mean, Henley? How did you know about Henley? How do I know? Uh, Mr. Kruger. That's why we're going to Chicago to acquire Jason Henley and company. Oh, oh yes, Henley. That, that... Rachel? Rachel? Ra Rachel? Where are you? Uh, Mr. Kruger, who are you looking for? I'll, I'll, I'll see you later. But, but our plane leaves for Chicago she, and... She was just here. She, now, she can't have gone far. But Mr. Kruger, we have to get on that plane. You get on the plane. You go. But you're the one that has to examine the asset. Well, you do it, Carlson. But you have to make a decision by tonight. You make the decision. You go there and you make it. Mr. Kruger, Mr. Kruger, where are you going? <laughs> Mr. Kruger, what happened? You, you look exhausted. Yeah, yeah, I guess I, I guess I am. What is? I thought I, I heard, heard the, I, I saw, I saw. I, I ran. What is? I ran. I ran around for hours, trying, trying, just trying. I know why. It, it, it's because, it's because this would have been our anniversary, our first anniversary. Yes, sir. I know that, sir. I took the liberty of opening this bottle of champagne. And, uh, I brought two glasses. Oh, thank you, Willis. Thank you. Good night, sir. Yes. I thought I... thought I did it, Rachel. I thought I did it today. I thought I brought you back. I thought I heard you. But I'll keep trying. I'll, I'll keep trying. I'll never stop trying, Rachel. Oh, Rachel... Rachel, I can see us so clearly that day, that crazy day I ran into you. And you were so frightened at first. You were so scared. It was, it was all I could do to get you to tell me your name. And I, I kept asking, what's your name? What's your name? And you just kept staring at me. And your eyes were so big. And finally, you said... My name is Rachel. Rachel. That's a very pretty name. What's yours? Barney. Barney? I like the sound of that. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry about the car. Oh, I don't mind. I never liked this car anyhow. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, Rachel. I'll have it fixed. No, 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 no. I won't have it fixed. I'll buy you a new one. <laughs> Are you that rich? Oh, I'm fabulously wealthy. But, but don't hold it against me. <laughs> do you know you really... You really are a very nice person. How can you tell? I learned how to recognize good people. It was very important for me to know that at one time. Rachel, do you want to hear something crazy? <laughs> Nothing is really crazy when you think about it for a while. No, no, no. This is the wildest thing you'll ever hear. What is it? Here I am, an American, driving through a place called Henley just outside of London. I hit a car some girl is driving, and we stopped to talk. And ten minutes later, I find out I'm in love with this girl. All I know about her is her name. Her name, Rachel. Now, go ahead. Tell me I'm not crazy. Hmm. 
Perhaps we're both crazy. All I know about you is your name. Barney. And I love you. Rachel. Rachel, you're here. I'm here. It's, it's you. It's really you. It's not my imagination. Put your arms around me, darling. And, and the ring, your wedding ring. You're wearing the ring. Oh. You, you couldn't be wearing the ring if it weren't really you, Rachel. Oh, Barney, you did it. You brought me back. Yes, yes, yes. You're back. You're back. That's all I have to know. You're back. <laughs> It all shows what can happen when you're in the habit of saying no. But is she back? Is it possible? You remember the story of Orpheus? He went to the land of the dead to reclaim his lost bride. He almost succeeded, too. However, there was a little detail he forgot about. I won't forget to return shortly with Act Three. It's part of the culture of our country. We raise the kids on slogans like, never say die, don't give up the ship. And when threatened with annihilation by a numerically superior enemy, didn't an American general earn immortality by simply answering, nuts. Barney Kruger took it all seriously. He believed he could attain any goal he set out to reach. He's even brought his wife back from the dead. Barney, I knew you would do it for me. I knew you would do it. Oh, Rachel, I can hardly believe it. Everything in the room, it's exactly the same. Exactly. Yes, yes, I didn't touch anything. Nobody touched anything. Everything is here, you see? Just as I left. Yes, your clothes, all your things. E e even the book you were reading, darling. Oh. Look, look, it's still open to the same page. That's why I could come back, Barney, because... Everything that's me is here. Oh, you were never gone, Rachel. Never. Keep me here, Barney. Keep me here. Yes, I will. I will. I, I just wish I knew how. But you know how. You know. Hey, excuse me, sir. I, uh, I, I thought... I thought I heard you talking Withers. here. Winter, Winters, look. It's uh, Mrs. Kruger. See, dear, it's Winters. You always liked Winters. Is, isn't that just great, Winters? She's back. Uh, uh-oh. Yes, sir. Barney. Mom. Well, what's the sensational surprise? I hope you're hungry. Oh, of course I am. Am I late for lunch? Oh, you'll remember this lunch as long as you live. Well, uh, I see the table set for three. Who is your guest? Oh, no, no guest, Mom. It's all family. Family? Mom, I had a problem. Oh, are you asking me to help? Yes, yes. Well? Well, I, uh, I didn't realize how complicated a thing like this would be. You see, after all, legally, she is dead, and, uh... And what? And there was a death certificate, a, a burial, and, uh... Well, how can I account for the fact... Barney, what are you trying to say? Mom, how, how, how do I, uh... Re reintroduce her in, into the world? Barney... Are you all right? Mom, Mom, she's back. Who? Who do you think, Rachel? Barney, I... did I... it, Mom, I did it. I made the miracle. I made it happen. No, Barney. Wait, wait. Just wait. You'll see. You'll see. You'll see with your own eyes. Now, wait. Now, Barney, please. Wait, 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 Mom. Wait. Rachel? Rachel, Mother's here. It's time for lunch. Well, Mother? Mom? Come on, now. I know it's a shock, but here she is. Here? Who is? Rachel. Well, can't you say anything? Barney. You mean you can just stand there and not do anything, Mother? Barney, I, I don't know what... Well, a, a, a normal person would, would, would put her arms around... Barney. Please, Mother. You, you, you claim you don't see oh, Rachel? Oh, Barney, my son. Now, just a minute. Winters, Winters, come in here. 
Barney, let me call. Wait, Mother. Winters. Uh, yes, sir. Winters, how many people are here in this room? How many, uh... How many people, sir? Yes, you heard me. There's you, my mother, myself, and... And? And my wife. Ah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Winters. That'll be all, Winters. Yes, sir. Well? That man worships you, Barney. He'd lay down his life for you. He'd swear on the Bible. What do you say now? I say that Winters is wrong to help you perpetuate this... This fantasy. Oh, is that what it is? Barney, please let me call... A, do- a doctor, huh? Naturally. But what else? You say you don't see Rachel. Rachel huh? is... I didn't ask you that. I asked you if you see Rachel. No, Barney, I don't see Rachel. I believe you. Well, then... You don't, you don't see any woman as a part of my life, oh, mother. Oh, Barney. You know, it's a funny thing, Ma, now that I look back on it. You never really wanted me to get married. No, oh, sure, sure, you always said so. And you encouraged me to meet this one or that one or the other one. But that was just the paint on the top, Mom. Somehow or other, you'd always top me off at the last minute. Now, Barney, why would because I... Because you wanted me all for yourself. <gasps> Barney! Papa's been dead 25 years. You never went out with another guy once. Oh, why? Barney, I... Even today, hundreds of men, guys who are really up there, too, they all go for you, Mother. How come you never even look at anybody? Barney, this is not the time. You wanted me all to yourself, and you still want it that way. That's why you don't see Rachel. But he is not Rachel! He... Rachel, say hello to Mother. Hello, Mother. She's not here, huh? Who just spoke? Who's standing right next to me? Barney, what do you want me to say? It isn't as if you were a little boy and we can play little games together. I'm not. I'm not your little boy anymore, Mother. I'm, and I'm on my own. And, and there's another woman in my life. Barney, please. I want you to face reality. Mom, she's not throwing you out. She's not taking your place. She's what... She's what another part of me needs. Now, please, Mom. Just take her in your arms, huh? And tell her she's welcome. She's your daughter. <laughs> What do you want, Carlson? This is the first time you've been to the office and we... Is that so? I've had to make a lot of judgments. Well, that's what you get paid for. But if I'm wrong, we, we, we can go broke. Oh, come on. I'll lay everything on the table and I'll straighten it out. Well, the Midwest merger... Well, I, the Midwest merger? Well, I'll tell you what I've decided. I've been juggling all the facts. And now that I think about it... Yes? Now that I, now that I think about it... Uh, just a minute. Now, the option expires this afternoon. We really have to move quickly. Yes, just, just a minute, please. Darling. Hello. I miss you, Barney. Yes, I miss you, too. I need you to keep me here. Don't stay away from me, Barney. No, I won't. I need all of your faith, all of your strength, all of your will. Darling, you've got it. I need you to hold me, Barney. Yes, yes. Hurry back to me, darling. Hurry before I slip away again. No, no, no. Don't do that. I'll be right there. Hurry, bye. Hurry. I'll see you, Carlson. Where are you going? I have an important date. Mr. Kruger, we are going broke. Can't you understand? I need half a million dollars to cover an option this afternoon. We don't have... Well, don't bother me with details. And unless you raise another 500000 by Wednesday morning... All right, we... all right, I'll raise it. But I Is don't there anything see when else... you can raise... Just leave it to me. Oh. Please. Now, I'm going home, and I don't want anybody to disturb me. Barney. Hmm. Do you ever get tired of me? After the life you led before? Now, what kind of life did I lead before? Well, you went everywhere. Well, we go everywhere, the two of us. Even if we never leave the house, we sit here together and... Oh, uh... Barney, I hope I'm enough for you. No, 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 we don't need that kind of talk. Because I'll have to be enough for you. I'll need you with me all the time. <laughs> Tell my son I wish to see him, Winters. I am sorry, ma'am, but he refuses to see anyone. Now, don't you take that tone with me. I'm his mother. I I said I was sorry, ma'am. I'll have to ask you to leave. You will have to throw me out. Winters, what's... Oh. That'll be all, Winters. Yes, Barney, I must talk to you. What's there to talk about? Barney, this newspaper. Read it. I don't care about anything. Just 
Read it. The incredible collapse of the Kruger Enterprises. The disappearance of Barney Kruger from the command post is the possible cause You see, of the... you're broke. You don't have money to throw around anymore. You know, if you had that ring right now... Now, Mother, I don't want to hear any more. If you had that ring, you could hold off some creditors, buy some time. Will you let me alone? The world won't let you alone. Now, you won't be able to keep this house... Mother, I don't want to hear any more. Don't you say that you don't care. This is a conceit of yours. But it takes money to maintain it. Mother, I think you've said enough. Now, do you want to say hello to Rachel before you leave? Barney, there is no Rachel... You and I saw her placed in her grave. Rachel is dead. No! Rachel's right oh, here. Oh, Barney. Please, let it be over. Whatever it is or was that raged through you like a fever, let it be over. Come back into the world. Come back where you belong. Well, I belong with Rachel. Goodbye, Mother. Oh, you're... You're like your father. He was a man who was intoxicated by liquor and it destroyed him. And you're... You're intoxicated by Rachel. Mother. By a dead Rachel. And she will destroy you, too. I won't hear any more. Barney, hold me. I can't be broke. I can't be. Hold me, Barney. You know, I'm crazy. I must be going crazy. Hold me, Barney. Kiss me. What? Hold you? Hold me. But Rachel... But what, Barney? Hold me. I need all of you to hold me. Put your arms around me. But, but Rachel, you're... you're, you're uh... I'm what, Barney? You're dead. What did you say? You're... you're... you're dead. Oh. Yes. Now I'm dead. If you're dead, why... Why do I see you so clearly? Because all of your strength hasn't left me yet. It's going. And soon I won't... Rachel. Rachel, are you here? No, Barney, you couldn't keep me here. You weren't strong enough. You don't want me... Enough. Rachel, you're becoming dim, Rachel. I'm no longer your wife. Here. Your ring. No. Take your ring. No, 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 no. I don't want that. I don't want it. You didn't believe the miracle. Ra- Rachel, don't go. I, I Don't go. I believe, Rachel. I do believe. Goodbye, Bonnie. Goodbye. Ra- Rachel? Ra- Rachel? Rachel? Barney. Mother, she was here. She was here. She's been here in this room all the time. Barney, sit down. Now, have Winters get you something. No, she was here, Mother. You know. Barney. You know she was here. It's time that we face certain facts. Now, you know that Rachel has... (gasps) Barney. Look. Look. What's, What's that lying on the floor? Well, it... Mother, mother, it's the rain. And there it was, gleaming on the floor, a huge diamond ring, the gift of Barney to Rachel, the ring that was buried with her when she died. And you can believe that she returned to the grave and left the ring to release him from their marriage vow. You can believe that. But if you're one of those practical two plus two must equal four people, we have another alternative. I'll be back shortly. Rachel come back from the dead and leave the ring? An explanation that might satisfy some of the more literal-minded among us is that realizing how strapped he was becoming financially, Barney may have paid a visit to the grave 
and removed it himself. After all, it was his ring. It goes to prove that we have a denouement to satisfy every taste. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Joan Loring, Anne Petoniak, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Well, it's our thinking that's wrong. That's what Mildred said. So when she had a pain, she, she changed her thinking. <laughs> Sounds so simple. Yeah, for her it was. Matthew, I want your permission to do an autopsy on your dead wife. An autopsy? Yeah. I want to have her body exhumed and do an autopsy. Well, will they let you do that? With your permission. I think I can get her father's. Yes, but what excuse will you give? Oh, that there's a possibility she was, well, maybe ill, maybe incapacitated before the truck hit her, something like that. Do I have your permission, Matthew? Well, I... Hester, should I say yes? Well, I think you should. But look at it this way. It'll be the first autopsy ever performed on a known witch. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. So rapid has been the advance of 20th century science in the diagnosis and cure of disease that one pictures men of medicine as seizing avidly on any discovery which contributes even slightly to their understanding the human body. And in general, such a picture is accurate. But what shall be said of Dr. Kilner's remarkable experiment? An experiment which might have revolutionized the whole field of medicine had not doctors and laboratory experts chosen to ignore it. <laughs> The record of Dr. W.J. Kilner's astonishing discovery may be found in a book entitled The Human Atmosphere. There he recounts how on a summer's day 12 years before he happened, by the merest chance, to stumble on a strange and inexplicable fact. He and his assistant were working on a routine experiment in the laboratory of St. Thomas Hospital in London. All right, Alex. I'm ready for the viewing screen now. It's got some sort of a dye on it, hasn't it, Doctor? Yes, I stained it myself this morning with dicyanine. Hold the screen up, Alex. Let's see if it's dying. Wait a moment. What in the devil's name is that? What? Behind the screen. It's my arm. But what's around your arm? Around it? Why, nothing. Nothing you can see, perhaps. Alex, I want you to disrobe. I want to see your whole body behind that screen. The laboratory assistant, completely baffled by Dr. Kilner's sudden intense excitement removed his clothes and stepped behind the viewing screen. A sort of an aura, all different colors, extending beyond the surface of your skin. The human body, at least your body, throws off a strange kind of substance. In the first feverish flush of discovery, Dr. Kilner had no doubt that he had correctly interpreted the amazing thing he'd seen. But an hour later, he began to wonder. And so he summoned one of his patients from a ward in the hospital and asked him to stand behind the screen. I'm not crazy, am I, Alex? You see it too, don't you? Sort of a... Well, sort of an atmosphere all around his body. Exactly. The human atmosphere. But why is it so different up there around his chest? The radiations. They're a different color and a different texture altogether. By George, so they are. I'm sure they weren't like that when you... Good Lord. This man's a tubercular. And the aura's modified only in the region around his lungs. 
That screen's given us a new way to diagnose disease. Word of the doctor's discovery spread rapidly through the hospital. <laughs> the human atmosphere. You saw the radiation. How do I know they aren't the properties of the screen itself? Alex, you ready with, uh, with the other patient? Yes, doctor. Uh, well, then, uh, uh, help him to sit up behind the screen. If the radiations were just an optical illusion, if they were created by the screen itself, they'd always be present, wouldn't they, doctor? Well, then, take a look at the man who's there now. Do you see any aura? No, I don't. How do you explain that, Kilda? It's simple enough. You see, the body Alex is holding up in that chair happens to be a corpse. Dr. Kilmer made hundreds of difficult and invariably accurate diagnoses with the aid of his viewing screens. And yet, the record of Dr. Kilmer's work lies ignored, forgotten by contemporary science. This fact like the fact that the remarkable experiment itself can only be regarded as incredible but true. Mystery, starring Burgess Meredith, brought to you by the makers of Carter's Pills. Good evening, friends. Welcome again to the Inner Sanctum. I'm Raymond, your host. Come in, won't you, and uh, sit down. I'm uh, going to sit down for a moment, too. Hmm? Upset? Uh, yes. Yes, I am a bit upset. I've just been visiting with someone who always sets my nerves on edge. You're going to meet him in a little while. But the one thing I hope is that you never meet him in real life. Professionally. Inner Sanctum Mysteries has the honor to bring you the distinguished young star of Broadway and Hollywood, Burgess Meredith. Tonight, Mr. Meredith appears in the role of Hunt Clayton in Hell is Where You Find It, an original mystery drama written by Robert Newman and presented for your entertainment by the makers of Carter's Little Liver Pills, the best friend to your sunny disposition. to begin. My friend, I told you you'll be meeting him in a little while. And when you do meet him, you'll know it. Just as Hunt Clayton did. So, turn down the lights, put your smelling salts where they'll be handy, and listen to the story of the man who discovered that hell is where you find it. City Morgue small room, its white tile floor and walls gleaming under the harsh glare of the naked electric light bulbs. Against one wall, a row of marble slabs, the still shapes on them covered by shrouds of coarse canvas. Suddenly, the door opens. Two men enter. One of them is the morgue attendant. The other is Hunt Clayton, wealthy art connoisseur and man about town. Walking to the last slab, the attendant turns down the shroud, exposing the face of a girl of a, about 20. Me, yes, sir? Yes, that's her. Pretty little thing. Even now. You're a relative? You want to claim the body? No, I was a friend, and I only came down to, uh, to mere, uh, are you sure she didn't have a note on her? Anything about why she did it? Yeah, nothing. It's 
Some how they never do when they go into the river. Look, her name was sewed into her clothes. You might not have been able to identify her. Mary. Mary Delaney. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. Another customer. Come in. Oh, excuse me, sir. I... I've come for my daughter. They said... Mrs. Delaney. You. You. What are you doing here, you murderer? Look, Mrs. Delaney. Wait a minute. Who's a murderer? He is. Him, Mr. Hunt Clayton, standing there so fine in his evening clothes. Just a moment, Mrs. Delaney. I know this must have been a great shock to you and all that, but last time I saw Mary was three months ago. I know that. And I know that the police wouldn't call it murder either. But still I say you killed her as sure as if you stuck a knife in her heart. Why do you think she did it? Took her own life that way. The faintest idea. Haven't you? Then I'll tell you. Taking her out, a poor innocent child. Turning her head with your presence and all. Making her fall so mad in love with you that nothing else in the world mattered. And then throwing her aside like an old shoe. Oh, I'm very sorry you feel that way about it, Mrs. Delady. I came here because, of, well, if you need any money for the funeral money? or anything else. Money, is it? Get out of here. Get out! Very well. As a matter of fact, I should be going anyway. You'd better go, Mr. Clayton. And go fast. I'm not going to put a curse on Though it's in my heart. Because I know there's no need for it. There's a curse on you already. A curse as black as your own black soul. What you did to my Mary isn't the end. You're going to go on. Doing worse things. Worse and worse. Until the devil himself catches up with you. And when he does. You're going to remember what I'm saying to you. Remember it for a long time. Lois. Lois, oh. darling. How nice you're going to finally show up at your own party. I'm terribly sorry, darling, but there was something I had to take care of. Your little torch singer? What? Karen, I told you that was finished. No, it's finished. The one person in the world I'm really interested in right now, and she is particularly beautiful tonight. Why, hon, thank you. Lois, let's leave now, you oh, and no, I. No, just darling, a... none of that. Isn't it time you paid some attention to some of your other guests? What for? Did they come here because they give a hoot about my art collection or me? No, they came because I have good liquor and... Be... Oh. Why, hon, you're shivering. <sighs> What's the matter? I don't know. Sudden chill, as if... As if someone had just walked over my grave. Or as if... Lois, who's that over there? Where? There, that tall, thin chap near the door. The one with the beard. Oh, that's a bit of a surprise for you. Oh, Prince. Prince. Yes. Yes, Miss Buck. Our wandering host has finally arrived. Prince Carlo de Tenebroso, Mr. Clayton. Not the Prince de Tenebroso owns the Aquilo Bronzes. Yes, Mr. Clayton. I've been most anxious to meet you as a fellow enthusiast in medieval art. I took the liberty of coming up here this evening without an invitation. Oh, very welcome. I noticed you looking at the altar screen. What do you think of it? A magnificent piece. Typically Florentine. Particularly the center section with the theme head. Yes. 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 That's principally why I bought it. Come inside and I'll show you my other purchase. Coming, Lois? No, hon. After all, someone should play host. You and the prince, go ahead. All right, Lois. This way, prince. Miss Barton is not interested in medieval art? Not particularly, but when a woman is that attractive, you know, no need for her to be. <laughs> Spoken like a true son of the Middle Ages. Here we are. Italian jewel box, 16th century. Beautiful, Mr. Clayton. Lovely. Simply beautiful. May I open yes, it? Yes, please. Nothing much in it. Just some trinkets. Mm. Yes, the usual thing. I, uh... I hold on. Mm -hmm. This ring here looks like... It is. Do you know what it is, Mr. Clayton? Uh, no. I don't think I've ever noticed it before. I haven't seen it for years. It's one of the poison rings of the Borgia. No. I'm certain of it. When you press the snake's head like this. See? A tiny needle punctures the skin. You'd better be very careful with it, Mr. Clayton. The Borgia poisons were very potent, very subtle. Yes, I know. One of the Borgia's rings. Well, I will be careful with it. I'd better put it away before. 
Someone else just came in who is very anxious to see you. Hunt, I must... Karen, I... what? Excuse me. Karen Ingram. Prince to ten of also. Pleasure, Miss Ingram, I assure you. Anything the matter? Matter? You're staring at me so strangely. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You, you just look awfully familiar. I, I was trying to remember where I'd seen you before. Might have been almost any place. But I imagine you're anxious to talk to Mr. Clayton, so... I'll go out with you, Prince. See you in a little while, hon. Right. So that's her. I must say you've got good taste. What was the idea of coming here? What was the idea of lying to me, telling me you were going out of town? I told you last week that we were finished. Aunt, you can't do this to me. You can't. Don't you understand? I love oh, you. Oh, you and your love. will make me laugh. All right, Aunt. I'll go. But you're going to be mighty sorry. Are you threatening me? In a way. You see, besides reading about this little party of yours in the papers, I saw something else. A couple of lines about a girl whose body was found in the river. A girl named Mary Delaney. What do you mean? I mean, I've got a hunch that maybe Miss Barton, your friend in the newspapers, might be interested in hearing who she was and why she committed suicide. Anyway... I don't you... be foolish, Clayton. You can stop her. Shut her up for good. What? The ring. The Borsha ring. Karen, wait. Come back here. What do you want? Oh, please forgive me, darling. I, I'm i not myself tonight, and I... If I meant what I'd said about being through with you, would I have bought you a present? A present? Yes, you see, this ring. It's lovely. It's very old. It's a token of love. Hunt. Oh, darling. Who will know about it? I told you the poison could never be detected. If you get out of here before it takes effect... Well, aren't you going to put it on for me, Hunt? Of course I am, darling. There. Oh, Hunt, if you only knew how... What's the matter? Something struck me. Yes. I'm not sure I like this ring. That, that snake on it. Darling, would you like to slip away from here? Just the two of us. Come with me. You mean now? Yes. Come on now. Oh, Hunt, I knew you couldn't possibly be as heartless as people said you were. Now, you wait over there by the door while I say goodbye to Lois and the Prince. All right, but hurry. Lois, Prince? Oh, there you are. What happened? Well, she agreed to leave if I take her home, and I won't be long. You'll wait, won't you? I'm afraid I shan't be able to, Mr. Clayton. But I am most anxious to see you again. How about driving down to my place in the country, say, tomorrow? I'm looking at my collection. Prince, I should like that very much. I will phone you in the morning, then, and tell you how to get there. And if you'd like to bring someone with you... Lois? Are you sure you'd like me to come with you? Not with Ingrid? No, Lois. Oh, Please. very well. Oh, but she does look very forlorn standing there. Suppose we go over and say goodnight to our prince. That is the most generous thought. Let's. You've had anything more unpredictable and therefore more charming than a woman, Mr. Clayton. I I'm awfully sorry you've decided to go, Miss Ingram. Oh. Well, don't you feel well? Oh, as a matter of fact, I don't. It just came over me a minute ago, and I... Hunt. What is it, Karen? What are you staring at? The prince. And that wooden screen. The face in the middle of it. Yes. Remember I said he looked familiar? That's what he reminded me of. <laughs> you mean the prince looks like Satan? <laughs> Karen, you are ill. <laughs> Did you hear from Karen today? No, dear. I was too busy to call her this morning. Is it much, Father? I don't think so, no. At least not according to the directions the prince gave me. Well, that's good. The country seems to be getting wilder and wilder. That storm's coming up off the Now, well, don't worry, darling. We'll make it all right. I know you think I'm being foolish, but I'm a little sorry you accepted his invitation to drive up here. Why, Lois? I don't know. He is rather a strange man. After you and Miss Ingram left last night, I, I looked at that carving of the fiend's head on the altar screen again, and, well, there was a resemblance. Oh. All the same eyes, long, narrow face. Oh, Lois. All right. <laughs> Told you I knew it was foolish. Yeah. Oh, there comes the rain. Oh. You better shut that window. All right, I'll do it like... Oh! oh. What's that? 
nothing, darling. Just thunder. What is that? I, I meant to hit that, that building. See? What? Yes. That must be the prince's place. Oh. It's pretty gloomy looking. Gloomy? With all those cypresses around it, it, it looks like a mausoleum. Oh, hon, I'm, I'm scared. Of what? I don't know, but... Oh, darling, please turn around. Let's go back. Why, we're almost at the gate. Don't be silly, Lois. Please, please, please. Hon, I, I tell you, I'm frightened. If you won't go back, then stop the car and let me get out. Nonsense. Hon, hon, will you stop the car? If you won't, I will. Lois, what are no. you doing? Let go of that brake. Let go, it's getting... What is it? No. Oh. Prince's house looks like a mausoleum. How very appropriate. And Hunt Clayton, who was responsible for the suicide of Mary Delaney, the murder of Karen Ingram, thinks Lois is silly for being afraid of the place. Hmm. Oh. Oh, you think there may be someone there to protect her? Well, maybe, but I wouldn't be too sure. Remember, there are few things you can really count on. Including one's disposition. Now, shall I go on with our story? Several hours later now, about nine o'clock that evening, and Hunt Clayton is lying in bed in a strange room. He's just opened his eyes. Puzzled, he's looking about him. Suddenly the door opened. Well, Mr. Clayton, so you are starting to sit up and take notice. Splendid. Prince, where am I? What happened? Do you not remember? You had an accident right at the gate. You were unconscious when we picked you up, so we carried you into the house here and sent for a doctor. He said you had a mild concussion, but that you'd be all right when you came to. That's right. Yes, I remember. Yes, Lois tried to stop the car, and I grabbed the brake and went into a skid, and... Lois, where is she? Was she hurt? Not even scratched. She waited to hear what the doctor had to say. Made sure you were all right, and then she left. Went home by train. Oh, you do feel all right. Yes, I feel fine. Perfect, in fact. I, I think I'll get up, if I may. I'm afraid your clothes are rather a mess, but uh, here is a robe and slipper. Thank you. Let me help you. Thank you very much. I, I am a little weak in the knees. I don't suppose you. Such a thing as a drink around, do you, Prince? I certainly do have. You feel well enough to come downstairs? Just lead the way, please. I sincerely hope this isn't going to be too much for you. Mm-hmm. You see, I have a bit of a surprise for you. In fact, several surprises. Really? What sort? Well, the first one's right in there, in my study. Open the door and go in. Open the door, all right. Helen! Hello, hon. Can't be you. You're dead. What are you doing here? You kept calling for her while you were unconscious, so I took the liberty of asking her to come up here. She just arrived a few minutes ago. Are you sorry, Hunt? No. no. I'm not. Somehow I'm not. Somehow. I mean... It's all right. I understand. I may be wrong, but I have a distinct feeling that this is somewhat of a reconciliation. And I think we should all have a drink on it. Miss Ingram? Oh, thank you. What is it? A special vintage of my own. I'm sure you've never tasted it before, Mr. Clayton. Thank you. Would you care to give us a toast? A toast, yes. Here's to the future, what lies ahead of us. And here's to you, Karen. Karen, I don't think I've ever really seen before this. Very gallantly put. And now, since you are down here, would you like to look around a bit, Mr. Clayton? Hmm? Yes, yes. Good. Uh, what you see on the walls here is just a part of my arms collection. This rapier, for instance. It's the one Mephistopheles used when he helped Faustus kill Marguerite's brother, Valentine. Oh, come now, Prince. You know that just happened in the opera. Did it? What about this sword here? The one that was used to behead Mary, Queen of Scots. Did that only happen in an opera, too? Well, no, but... What do you think, Hunt? Is he just making it all up? Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I wasn't listening. You seem more interested in Miss Ingram than in my collection, Mr. Clayton. Which I don't blame you. Why don't you take her outside onto the terrace? Yes. Sure you don't mind, Prince. There is something I'd like to talk to her about. 
Not at all. Go right ahead. Thank you. Come on, Karen. Out here. It is rather strange, that. The river down there looks more like lava than water. And those hills, they're so barren, they, they might be the mountains of the moon. Karen, Karen, darling, what's come over us? You and me. I haven't been able to take my eyes off of you since I first saw you sitting there tonight in the study. Why do you seem so different now? More lovely and more desirable than you've ever been. Well, perhaps it's because I've grown up, Hunt. You see, I had a dream last night that opened my eyes to a great many things. A dream? Remember that ring you put on my finger yesterday? Well, I dreamed it was a poison ring. That you were trying to kill me. Karen, that wasn't a dream. That was a poison ring. Oh. Thank heaven. It didn't work. Because if it had, Karen, darling. Oh, darling, you do love me. More than I've ever loved any woman. You're all that I want in the world. Everything. And holding you tight in my arms this way. I... Oh. Uh, Hunt, what's the matter? I don't know. Oh. You suddenly feel cold. As cold as... Good Lord. What is it? You're not Karen. You're a skeleton. Keep away from me. Keep away. Don't come near me. Ah! 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 Prince! Prince! Anything the matter, Mr. Clayton? Karen! Oh, out there. I was holding her in my arms and she turned into a skeleton. Oh, that. Yes. Why should you be surprised? What? Isn't that merely an extension? What you've always sought? Searched for? What are you saying? All your life. You've been looking for a woman who would make no demands on you. Ask nothing in return for her love. In short, you wanted a woman without a soul. Yet you cannot face the consequences. For as you've seen, its logical development is... death. Who are you? Had you taken the trouble to translate my name into English... The English? Prince de Tenebroso. The Prince of Darkness. The Devil. Yes, Mr. Clayton. And then, this is... Yes, Mr. Clayton. Through many years of complete ruthlessness and viciousness, and by causing the death of two innocent women, you have delivered yourself most completely and efficiently into my hands. <laughs> I don't believe it. I don't believe it. It's a trick, some kind of trick, is it? The wine has been drugged, and now Karen... Oh, yes? Karen? Karen, she's in it with you. She wants to get even with me for what I tried to do to her. Blast her, she rots! I am afraid you will have to remain here with me from now until Judgment Day. And eternity is a long, long night. No, it's a trick, I tell you, a lie! I'm dead, am I? I was dead, would I be able to handle the sword this way? You think I know the feel of a good blade when I have it in my hand? My dear Mr. Clayton. Get away from that door. I don't know who you are, what your game is. But you're not going to keep me here. You're really being very childish and very obstinate. Get away from that door. If you don't. All right, you ask for it. Oh, dear. <sighs> One of my very best smoking jackets. Through the heart. I stabbed you through the heart. Will you pull it out, Mr. Clayton? Or do you want me to? Thank you. Through the heart. And no blood. Nothing. Seemed the easiest way to convince you. Now, do you believe? No. No, you can't keep me here. You can't. I'd keep away from that window if I were you, Mr. Clayton. There is no escape that way, and it's a long, long fall. Don't stay, I tell you. I won't. I... Come in. Prince de Tenebroso, 
Yes? I'm the coroner. Oh, yes. Uh, this is Miss Lois Barton, the other witness. How do you do? How do you do? I'm very sorry to bother you, but I wonder if you'd mind going over the facts of the case again. Why not at all? I met Mr. Clayton for the first time the night before last. Invited him down here. He and Miss Barton had a bit of an accident. Smashed their car up right at the gate. When we picked him up, carried him into the house, he was unconscious. I called in a doctor. He examined him. Said he had a mild concussion. He remained unconscious for several hours. When he came to, he seemed perfectly normal, except that he kept calling Miss Barton Karen. Is that so, Miss Barton? Yes. Yes, it is. He went outside onto the terrace with her. Came running back in great agitation, claiming she'd turned into a skeleton. I tried to calm him, but he grabbed a rapier from the wall and attacked me. When I disarmed him, he ran to the window and threw himself out. As you can see, it's a long drop. It's close to 100 feet. Hmm. You confirm everything the prince said, Miss Barton? Yes. Yes, I do. The only thing I can't understand is why he kept shouting that the prince was the devil. I wonder... Of that. Do you believe as Hunt Clayton did? Huh? The prince. You can translate his name any way you like. Perhaps he was just a harmless collector of medieval art, but uh, why did he smile so cryptically when the coroner said that Clayton was out of his mind? Perhaps it was because he knew, as Hunt Clayton found out, that hell is where you find it. Sometimes right in your your own mind, a heart. There's a key to every situation. Behind every unopened door, there is a mystery. And the opening of this door introduces us to another in the series, the key. Okay, Corporal, sound mail call. Yes, sir. This letter is the hardest I ever had to write. And I guess it's not one we're going to write. If I weren't such a coward, I suppose I'd wait till you come home on phone. But maybe this is the best way, after all. I know how you hate scenes. And I don't know how I could tell you this to your face without creating some kind of a scene. However, I've always felt that we would never get married. That you really wanted some kind of out from me. Well, you could say I'm giving you out there. Because I'm afraid I've been untrue to you since you went back to the rear. I know this will hurt you. But I really don't know what else to say. Except, please forgive me. You crazy? In the pitch dark? You know, mow us down. We're supposed to get back to HQ tonight, remember? Yeah, we're supposed to get there. That's just it. 
We rush that bunch out there. Nobody's going to get back to each one. What's the matter, Corporal? Lost your nerve? Looking for an out on Section 8. What? Why, you... Yeah. Uh, you stink. When we get back, Corporal... If we get back, you mean... If we get back, I'll be only too happy to settle with you, Sergeant. That's a lousy thing to say. Okay, we're square. Let's forget it. I don't figure you lately. You act like a heel. I was breaking your neck to take risks. You know as well as I do there's no sense in jumping those reds out there. If we wait, they'll most likely move on. I hate sitting around. Yeah. You think you just hate to stay alive. Oh, Yank! Hey, Yank! What now? Hey, Yank, you're a wife, pretty girl. I, I love your wife, Yank. Those dirty now, little... Take it easy, take it easy. You know that old gag? Hey, Yank! All I want is for one of us to show. Where are you, Yank? They'll straddle his whole position. Hey, Yank! Your girlfriend got another guy. How do you like that, Yank? All right, all right. Shut yourself to death. What you about your break. wife, Yank? Give me the B.A.R. Wait a minute. Take it easy. Hey, Yank. Yeah. You don't have a wife, anyway. I love your girlfriend, Yank. Yeah. Come on. Give it to me. Oh. Come on. You nuts. Leave it be, you crazy. Hey, Why yeah. are you? Get on. Get on. Got a belly full of sitting here listening to hey, that. Hey, yeah. Yank. Why don't you answer, Yank? Yeah? Here's your answer, you yellow swine. <laughs> Mighty poor effort, Sergeant. I guess you know that. I did what seemed best at the time, sir. Yes. Well, your best was to lose six men, including Corporal Harvey. We're short of men here and shorter of non-coms. I can't afford to let you make too many showings like that. Yes, sir. If I wasn't so short of sergeants, I'd have one of your stripes right now. So consider yourself lucky. But next time, I'll break you to the ranks, so help me. Now get on the ball, Sergeant, and stay there. Come in, Sergeant. Huh? Oh, Padre, yes, yeah, sure. I didn't wake you, did I? I didn't want to break up a man's rest. No, no, I wasn't asleep. Not enough to sleep nights without trying it in the daytime. Yeah, but you've been on night patrols lately. You wouldn't get to sleep at night anyway. You're not on night patrol anymore. Oh. Yes, I uh, I heard about the trouble you ran into a week ago. It's been pretty rough. Yeah, yeah, I was right. Mind if I sit a while? Sure, help yourself. Okay. Uh, smoke? Nothing. You know, uh, I was thinking, Brad, quite a time since you had a furlough. Man gets beat up after too long a stretch out here, and sometimes the up brass gets forgetful of that. There's a war on, Padre. A man can't expect to take a rain check on combat duty when he feels like. Like me to have a word with the CO? Sometimes you'll take notice of me. <laughs> Not often, but sometimes. No, thanks. I'm okay. You want to help out? There are plenty of guys who need it. You need it, Brad. Look, lay off, will you, Padre? Just because I goofed that patrol, it doesn't mean I'm beat. I made a mistake. Show me the sergeant who has it. Yeah, true enough. But remember, it's, uh, it's battle fatigue makes a man prone to errors of judgment. You know that, Brad. I'm okay. Well, anyway, uh, wouldn't you like to get, get home and see your folks for a spell? I don't have any folks. There's nobody I want to see. Brad, I haven't seen you around at mail call for quite a while. And Tommy Pulaski told me that when he handed you a couple of letters that had been lying in the office for three days, you tore them up without reading them. Pulaski's got a big mouth. He has no right to discuss my business. With anyone. We meant well. I know you're not married, Brad. Were those letters from a girl? If you don't mind, Padre, I guess I am a little sleepy after all. Guess I'll take a nap. Okay. But I can tell you right now, Brad, 
If you're trying to forget something that really matters, something that goes deep... What you are you talking about? I don't have anything to forget. Yet you destroyed those letters without reading them. On the night of that patrol, there was the enemy taunts about girlfriends that got you mad. He doesn't figure. Padre, I don't like to be rude, but why don't you mind your own business? The peace of a man's soul is my business, Brad. Yeah, well, I... I'm okay. Thanks. Look, just leave me alone, will you? I guess maybe you're not much of what they uh, you call a, a praying man, Brad. I don't get to see much of you at church today. Man's got to sort things out for himself. Whining for somebody's help is in the way. I wasn't talking about whining. I was talking about praying. There's a difference. So maybe... Maybe you're not smart enough to know that. I, I didn't mean any offense. I... Look, praying, I wouldn't even know how to start. I'd have to feel it. Well, the words wouldn't... There's no special way to pray, Brad. But you're right. You've got to feel you want help. Then the words will come. Padre. Yes, Lieutenant. Padre, you better get out to the hospital. The patrol mm -hmm. just come in. Some of the men are in a bad way. Oh, I'll come right away. They stuck real trouble over toward Bruno's Hill. If it hadn't been for Carswell. Carswell? Brad Carswell? The Sergeant Carswell? Yes. Bombed the machine gun position from the rear. They had the section pinned down. If it hadn't been for him, none of the men would have made it back here. Funny, I had him figured for a guy that was going to pieces. But he sure did a job this time. Yeah, sure enough, Padre, that's the way it was. Them Reds had us sitting there just waiting for them to take us any time they wanted to. Wasn't nothing we could have done, no. And man, I tell you, I had to work. <laughs> Excuse me, Padre, but anyways, that's just how it was. Uh, what about the sergeant? Him. Well, he up and turned the tables on them reds, that's what. He went out there with two grenades and worked his way right around to the back of them enemy men until he was right on top of them, yes, sir. I now him bust out laughing just to see the way he'd done it. He bombed them out, huh? Well, he sure enough did. The way he was setting, it would have been like shooting fish in a barrel if it hadn't been for that red seeing him up there and let him have it with them automatic pistols. Man, I, I don't know how he's alive, and that's a fact. Yes, he's badly shot up. One bullet struck his helmet Gave him pretty bad concussion. Yeah, well, they didn't shoot him up bad enough or quick enough because he just dropped them two grenades right in their laps and wham! <laughs> no use saying I, I ain't glad it was them that in that hole and not me. I'd be lying elsewhere. I sure am, sure am real obliged to that sergeant. Oh, I, I think you all are, the whole party yeah. claim. Yeah, sure enough, he's he's quite a man, that sergeant. Hey, uh, Padre, though, uh, funny thing about him. Yeah, what's that? Well, uh... Uh, oh, uh, I reckon you wouldn't have any chaw in the back there on you, would you, Parker? Uh, no, not right now, but I, I'll see what I can do about it. Thanks, I, I sure could use some. Well, as I was saying about the sergeant, uh, when we was bringing him in, he was kind of, uh, well, uh, un unconscious, you know? Yeah. But uh, kind of dreaming or something, uh, like he was uh, asleep, you know? Well, uh, how do you know he was dreaming? Well, he was kind of moving his mouth around, uh, you know? I, I reckon he was trying to say something. Well, uh, did he actually say anything? No, no, not much, but he, he sure looked like he was trying for fair. But all he could get out was the one thing. And, and that you couldn't quite hear, and only after you got real close. A, and he kept on saying this one thing again and again. What was it, son? Well, now, I, I reckon it's the kind of thing that you ought to know about, you being a, a chaplain and all. I, I wouldn't tell them other men, but I, I reckon you ought to know. Yes, perhaps I should. Yeah, well, you know what he was saying? He was saying, please help me. Please help me. Kept on all the time, only, only he wasn't saying it like I said it then. He was saying it like he was real desperate. A and he wasn't speaking to no man, neither. Y you know what I reckon? I reckon that man was praying. Yeah. He was praying like he needed something. Real bad. Good morning, boys. Mail 
Hey, Paul. Hey, mail call. Now, honey, now, take it easy. I'll get around you all. Let's see now. Sergeant Brady Carswell. Um, oh, speak to you, Sergeant. Nice feminine hand, too. Hey, what? Private First Class C.H. Heatherweather. Two for you. Oh, man, oh, man. Thank you, ma'am. For my wife, I reckon. Oh, lucky you. Oh, uh, can you manage? I sure can. I can open them all right enough. But I reckon I might have to get you to answer them for me on account I can't write with this little old arm of mine. Sure. I'll be back in a little while. Private First Class uh, um, R.M. Ridgway. Now, two for you. Oh, man, am I glad to hear from my little old Annabelle. Uh, hey, that's my wife's name, uh, Annabelle. Uh, see now, what she say? Um, my own dear Slim. Boy, that's sure nice to read my own dear friend. Yeah, you think so. <laughs> hey, Sarge, hey, hey, listen to this. This will make you laugh fit to kill. She said it, it, it. Hey, Sarge. Hey, you, you ain't reading your letters. What? Oh, yeah, I'll read them later. Well, if you ain't the... Well, I can hardly wait to get my letters from home. Don't you want to read them? I said I'll get to them later. Read your own mail. Never mind about mine. Yeah, all right. Just don't seem right to me, though. That's all. Uh, well, I'll be free in about <laughs> half an hour, soldier. Would you like me to take your letter, then? Uh, uh, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am. That'll suit me just fine. Good. Well, what's the matter, Sergeant? Not reading your mail? Crying out loud. Why does everybody have to ask me a lot of silly questions? I don't want to read them. Take them away. Why? Look, I'll open them take for them you. Take them away, do you hear? Take them away. <laughs> Sure hope the crop is real good, like you say, Annabelle, cause uh, uh, cause I wouldn't want you to fool me none and say things was going fine if and they want. Uh, you got that, Miss? Mm-hmm. And say things were going fine if they weren't. Yep. Yeah. Uh, now what else can I say? Uh, you got any ideas? Well, no, I don't know. Um, what does she say in her letters? Isn't there something else you can comment on? Yeah, let's see. There's a uh, back of the call. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I reckon I better say something about young Jeff. Jeff? Your son? Yeah. Well, at least ways he ain't exactly my son, as you might say, but I look on him as my own. He's a fine boy, too. Going to be quite a man someday. Fifteen. Is he? Mm. Well, you must be growing up fast, I suppose. Oh, sure enough. But I ain't set eyes on him for more than a year. He's a fine boy, though. Fine boy. Well, what would you like to say about Jeff, then? Or how about sending the message, especially for himself? Hey, that's an idea, though. But, yeah, uh, put this here down. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, tell Jeff I'm glad to hear he's so grown up now, and I'm mighty proud of my boy. And tell him if he uses my gun to go after them possums and forgets to clean it, I'm going to belt the daylights out of him when I get back. Well, are you, uh, you sure you want to say that? Hmm? What about, um, about belting him, I mean? Oh, oh, sure, sure. He'll understand. I ain't never belted him yet. But I talk like that to him all the time. <laughs> oh, oh, shucks. I wouldn't lay a finger on that boy. Yeah, I reckon Annabelle just about killed me if I ever did. He's the apple of her eye, that boy. Well, I reckon it's natural him being her own flesh and blood and all. Oh, she's his son by another marriage. Another marriage? Well, no, Annabelle ain't really been married but once to me. No, no, you see, it was this way. She met this piece of poor white trash, and they was married all right, only it turned out the ceremony wanted a real one, and then, well, he just up and left her. I got so mad, I, I was going to kill him, and that's a fact. I got out my gun, and I was going to blow that man to kingdom come. You see, I, I'd known Annabelle since we was just babies, and, well, I reckoned I was going to marry her someday, but she was always kind of difficult, you know, acting like I weren't good enough for her. Well, I didn't know she was just putting it on to make me chase after her. That's the oldest trick in the world, Slim. Oh, sure enough, I know that now, but I was proud. And I was a mighty good-looking fellow then. Well, you can laugh now, but that's true. And, and the way I reckoned it was, well, if she wanted to act difficult, that was all right with me, and I could get me plenty of other gals. So she went with this other man? Yeah. Well, I reckon I pushed things a bit further. She got to think that I was serious about some other gal who just didn't care no more for her, and I reckon she must have been mighty unhappy at that. I know now, but I didn't know then. Anyways, I was all set to kill this man. But you didn't shoot him, did you? Oh, no, no, ma'am. I, I didn't. The preacher doesn't stop me. 
preaching? Oh, yeah, ma'am. You know, we have the all finest preachingest man in the town you ever did see. He preached fire and brimstone like he was the angel of the Lord himself. And he come up to me while I was walking down Main Street with my gun, and he said, Slim Heavyweather, he said, Slim, you got a killing look in your eye. And I said, show enough. And he said, Slim, you ain't going to kill no man. And I said, Preacher, you're about the wrongest man I know. <laughs> and, and you know, ma'am, i got to laugh now, but oh, it sure it wasn't funny then. I suppose not. What happened? Well, he sat to right then and there, right in the middle of Main Street, and he preached me right out of that killing mind. First, he preached me on the Sixth Commandment till that gun just fell from my hand, and I stood there mighty scared. And I was hoping he was going to let me go home, but he just went right on preaching. Slim, he said, you're in love with Annabelle, and you know it. And I said, sure enough. He said, and she's in love with you, and you'd know that, too, if you weren't blinded by your sinful pride. And he said... Well, I forget the words, but it's in the Bible about uh, uh, faith and hope and charity. And, and the greatest of them all is, is charity, you know? Yes, I know. Well, that preacher said I didn't have no charity in my soul. Well, I allowed this how I put money in the pool box whenever I could, thinking to please him. But man alive, he went all red in the face and he bawled out at me. Not that kind of charity, he said. He meant the charity of forgiveness, he said. You understand that, man? Of course. Well, I didn't before, but I sure enough did after that sermon, and I realized that he was right. I had been proud and sinful, me thinking I was too good for Annabelle because she'd been with that other man when maybe anyways it was all my fault in the first place. So, being fair-minded and all, I went right on out to Annabelle's place, and I said, Annabelle, I love you, you love me, and I'm going to marry you. So it ain't no good of you putting me off no longer. Well, that's quite a story, Slim. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry I run on so in this, but... Well, I, I ain't told that story to nobody. I, I reckon I must be homesick to you. <laughs> well, you should have a furlough coming when you get out of here, so you'll be getting back to see your wife pretty soon. And now let's finish your letter. You sleep, Sarge? Oh. No, I, I didn't reckon you was. You've been tossing and turning around over there. Hey, do, do you think you could reach my chaw in the back here? I hid it in the drawer when the nurse was around, and now I can't reach it with a see a little old arm of mine. Sure. Should be able to. Hey. Well, where'd you... All right, I got it. Here, coming over. Oh, careful now. Ah, uh, thanks. Boy, I sure need that. Mmm. Man, that sure tastes good. Mm. Say, Slim. Huh? I, uh, couldn't help overhearing what you were telling the nurse today. About, uh, about your wife. Mm hmm. Say, mind if I ask you a question? Personal one? Sure, you go ahead. Are you, uh, are you happy with your wife? I mean,. Knowing about the other man? Man, when I'm home with my Annabelle, I don't reckon there's a man happy in the whole world of me. She sure is a fine gal, and she loves me. And she's known that I love her, too, all this time that we've been together, and ain't nobody going to come between us again. What that old preacher man told me was true enough. About the charity of forgiveness? Mm, not only that. He, he said it wasn't only for me to forgive her. But for me to ask her forgiveness for making her feel so bad, so so lonely that she could fall for another man. Hey, uh, Sergeant, you uh, mind if I ask you a personal question? Well, I... Well, I, I reckon you'd be a mighty proud man yourself, Sergeant. I could figure that away anyway. And, oh, pardon me, but I noticed you got letters from a gal and... You ain't even got to read them yet. So I'd say you got woman trouble, man. Oh, but uh, here's my question, Sarge. Did you ever bother yourself to tell your gal that you're so in love with her that it hurts? Or, or did you always just reckon she'd be around if you felt like marrying her someday? 
Hey. Hey, what, what are you doing there? What are you, what are you looking for? Letters. Where'd she put them? Ah. Say, can I borrow your flashlight? Sure enough. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, sure enough. My darling, I can hardly write. My hand is trembling so. And if work is blotted with tears, I'm sorry, but I can't help it. I just can't. Oh, my dearest, of course I'll marry you. There never could be anyone else for me anyway. I love you. Love you. I can't think how I was ever stupid enough to imagine any other man could take your place. Nothing I've done could ease this desperate longing I've always had for you, Brad. And I know that what I did was a senseless and cruel thing to you and to myself. If you can indeed forgive and forget the past, you will never need to doubt me in the future. For as long as I know I have you love, I am completely yours. And my heart is bound to yours till the end of time. Hurry back to me, my man. My man. My man. Thank God. Oh, thank you. Closing door finishes the story. Next week, another key will open another door to another story. Mystery. Romance. Or adventure. All start when a door is unlocked by... The key. National Broadcasting Company presents Lights Out, a summer revival of some of the best stories in the series which many of our listeners will remember. Tonight's story, the fourth in the current series, is called The Battle of the Magicians. Lights Out, everybody. This is the witching hour. It is the hour when dogs howl and evil is let loose on a sleeping world. Sit in the dark now and listen to Lights Out. Is it true? True? What makes the thing true, Irene? Because you believe in it? Or because a million others believe in it? Or... I can tell you this. The Penal Code of Haiti contains a section promising death to any who create zombies. And if the sober lawmakers of the country believe enough of it to put it into their books of law, well, then... But it's impossible to raise the dead, Mr. Saladin. Impossible? I wonder... The folklore of every country is full of tales of bringing the dead back to life, bringing them back to serve the living. There are tales of vampires, ghosts, werewolves. But they're superstitions. Surely you don't... Who am I, my dear Irene, to say where truth ends and superstition begins? I, I'd like to know some more about zombies. I've told you all that is known of them. How they are living, yet not living, dead. How they are summoned from the grave by the black magic of some sorcerer. 
how they must do his bidding until he wearies of them. But must these poor dead people... Well, I mean, isn't there ever any rest for them? Can't they... Can they not die again? Yes, there is a way. Zombies eat, you know, even as human beings do. But only when they are fed, they will not seek food for themselves. And if they eat salt, if anything containing salt so much as passes a zombie's lips, then he must return forthwith to his grave. Oh, but Mr. Sellers. That's the tale, Irene. I do not make it up. But... Look you, these creatures of the darkness, these unholy beings of superstition, they must obey laws. Nature has its laws, so there are laws of the supernatural, immutable laws that all its creatures must obey, even as we creatures of nature must obey ours. You speak of superstition. But superstition is just belief. Ah, it is so. But we have been taught only in recent years to believe in certain things that science has learned. The germ theory of disease, for example. But that's true, Mr. Saladin. Perhaps, yes. I do not deny it. There is ample proof. There is also ample proof of the existence of supernatural beings. If one will take the trouble to look for it. Not proof. Proof indeed. But, hmm, it appears we have a visitor, Irene. Yes, sir. I'll see who it is, Mr. Saladin. Mm -hmm. Mr. Joseph Warner, president of Acme Airlines, Mr. Saladin. So? Show him in then, please. Yes, sir. Mr. Saladin, will see you, Mr. Warner. Thank you. Good morning to you, Mr. Warner. Yes, sir, Aladdin? Saladin, yes. You're some kind of detective. Some people have been, shall I say, kind enough to describe me as an investigator. I hear that you're good. Thank you. Won't you sit down? Hmm? And so you have come to consult me about the recent wrecks of your airplanes, Mr. Warner. How did you... Oh, yes, the newspapers, of course. Well, that's right, Mr. Saladin. So? You read about that one yesterday? Yes. Fourteen killed, including the crew of three. Absolutely no explanation for it. Except what you know, Mr. Warner. What? I said except what you know about it. What do you mean you by... You would not have come to me, Mr. Warner, unless... Well, suppose you explain. I'd like to know how you knew that. It is my business, sir. Uh... Yes, Irene? There's the window washer, Mr. Saladin. Can he come through your office? Very well. One moment, Mr. Warner. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> please. I, I got to get the windows washed. Hmm. hmm. That is a job I would not like very well, I'm afraid, Mr. Warner. But to your business. You uh, received a warning, hmm? Uh, yes, I received... How did you know that? I have some knowledge of the ways in which Dr. Ehrlich works, Mr. Warner. Ehrlich? That's, that's the name. I was rather certain. You may read the letter. It was a letter, I assume. Uh, yes. There were two of them. The first one a week ago. It said, this Dr. Ehrlich had need of $100,000, and the letter warned if I didn't come across, one of our ships would be wrecked. And you assume this was a, what does one say, a crank letter and did nothing about it? That's right. We get a lot of fool letters. And because you took that attitude, 14 people are dead. Horribly dead. Yes. You said there were two letters. Yes. Here's the other one. Mm -hmm. Today, the tornado. Take warning. And Alex's signature. The tornado was the name of the airplane that crashed... Yes, John Elliott was piloting it. The oldest, safest pilot on the line. I can't understand it. I can, Mr. Warner. You can? Tell me, when did you receive this letter? About five minutes before the flash came that the tornado had crashed. He timed it very well. Uh, yes, I... Did you make any effort to trace this letter? No, I... Well, there was so much excitement around the office, Of I... course. And so what do you wish me to do? I haven't given this to the police, Mr. Saladin. I, we, well, the publicity, you know. People would think it's easy to smash one of our airliners. You understand? Yes. You wish me to find Derek. 
to... What you do with her, Mistress Haladine, is no concern of mine, provided no more such things occur. Mr. Warnham, I know Alec of old. His life is forfeit a thousand times older. But he, you yourselves have an old proverb. First catch your rabbit. You catch him, Saladin. It'll be worth your while. Yes. Yes, it will be very much worth my while, my friend. Can you get to work at once, Mr. Saladin? I, well, you can understand we're uh, upset. I understand. I promise nothing, Mr. Warner, except that I will try. No man may do more. Well, that's all that I can ask. You'll go after him, then? It is agreed. Good. You, uh, have a cigar, ma- What says, uh, Let me see that. Uh, Let me see it. How the devil did that get in my pocket? Ha. Huh. Read it yourself, Mr. Warner. Oh, yes, sir. You have been very foolish to go to Saladin. Now your fate is sealed. I will destroy your airplanes one by one. And when the time comes, yourself. I have fought with Saladin before, as he well knows. This time is the last, Eric. So, my friend, you have brought upon yourself. He knows. How, how could he? Down, down on the floor, quick. <laughs> Score one for Saladin, I think. But what, what Our was... Our delightful what? friend, the window washer. I just caught sight of... Let us see what has happened. Good Lord, Saladin, do you think that he's... A crowd gathers in the street below. Morbid gazers on sudden death. Thank you, Irene. If you are ready. You... You won't hurt me, Mr. Saladin. I give you my word, Irene. I'm afraid. You need have no fear. No harm can come to you while I live. I do want to help you, Mr. Saladin. Only Listen to me one moment, Irene. Of 50 girls who applied for this position, I selected you. I've not told you why. No, I... I never could understand. It was for one reason, Irene. You have the little, oh, so very little, psychic spark that is lacking in all the other ones who came. You do not know it yourself, but Saladin knows. I must use you, but I shall not unless you consent wholeheartedly. I'll do it, Mr. Saladin. I trust you. You will not lose by it, my child. Look, then, we have a little time. Sit here. Sit comfortably. So. Now we begin. Look into the crystal. Look deep into it, my child. Say over and over to yourself. Early. 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 Eric. Eric. Go and seek Eric. out the soul of Eric the magician Eric. while he sleeps. Eric. Go and find him, Irene. Eric. Find Eric. Find Eric. Eric. Search deep in the crystal globe. Eric. 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 Who Eric. calls Eric? It is I, Saladin, that calls Alec. What do you want, Saladin? You will tell me where I shall find you, Alec. No, I shall not. You will tell Alec. No. I am master of your soul that wanders now while your body sleeps, Alec. You will tell me where to find you. I will not. Tell me. No. No. Tell me. In the tower. In the tower. I will not tell more. You will, Alec. 
Jeremy. In the tower. The highest tower of all. Ah. And where is it? This tower? I will not tell more. I will not. Tell, Alec. I will not. I will not tell. I say you shall, Alec. I will not tell. Beware. Your power wanes now, Saladin. Be sure you will not remember what you have told Alec when you awake. I will remember. By the five names I commanded, Alec, you will not remember. I will not remember. Alec. 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 Awake now, Irene. Awake, Alec. Irene. Awake. Mm. Huh. Are you all ready now, Mr. Saladin? Just sit quietly and rest, my child. So, Alec, I think perhaps we shall have a little talk together. <laughs> Hello, LeBlanc in Tweet 5. Radio check, please. KCT to LeBlanc in Tweet 5 on the line. Okay. LeBlanc to KCT. How are you, Shorty? KCT to LeBlanc. Okay, Frenchy. Who's your pilot today? LeBlanc to KCT. I do not know yet. Charlie Butler is sick all of a sudden. That is what I wait for. KCT to LeBlanc. Better see your records are straight before you take off, Frenchy. LeBlanc to KCT. <laughs> that is not my business, Shorty, my friend. I am just co-pilot. I pull up the landing gear, I sometimes land. I just go along for the ride. KCT to LeBlanc. Okay, Frenchy. Jazz your motors when your pilot's ready. I'll check you off. That's all, KCT. Are you the co-pilot on eh? this trip? Oh, oh you, you scare me a little bit. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you are a pilot? I am the pilot. Yes. We are ready to take off. Oh, we are ready long time. Uh, your papers are all right? The manifest is all right. Yes. I am uh, Francie Leblanc. Yes. Hmm. Well... Unlimited. Visibility unlimited. Temperature 44. Dew point 28. Barometer 29 dash 90. Okay to take off. KCT to LeBlanc. Bye. LeBlanc to KCT. Merci, Shorty. I, I see you Thursday. LeBlanc to KCT. Bye. Happy landings, Frenchy. Tony, moi, monsieur, uh, you want to take off, eh? I will take off, yes. Oui, oui, voilà. Up gear. Up gear, sir. You have checked everything, LeBlanc. Oui, I have checked everything. We are all right. Just long buggy ride. Ten passengers, mail, express. Right. How you like this plane, huh? All right. Excuse me, I, I do not think I catch your name, please. My name is Art. Edward Art. I am pleased to meet you, Monsieur Art. Uh, oh, you, you know what? I, I think I remember that name. There was a pilot named Art that died two weeks ago on the east end of the line. Is that so? Oui, it is so. He is a relative of you, Monsieur Rain? No, he is not relative. So? Uh, you like me to fly her a little while? No. I am pilot of this ship. I will do the flying. Ça va, Monsieur. So, you 
did find me after all, Saladin. The very clever Saladin. <laughs> well, I think this time the very clever Saladin has had his last adventure, no? I do not believe you will win, Alec. No? I do, my dear enemy. I have not time now to find how you learned where my laboratory is. But there is time enough for that. It is simple enough, Alec. You talked in your sleep, you see. <laughs> I remember now. I knew I had dreamed. But I forbade you to remember, Ellie. Yeah, well, one little victory. I've waited a long time for this, Saladin. Yes, and failed a great many times. I will not fail this time. What is written is written. <laughs> I should be interested in how you caused that airplane to crash yesterday, Alec. Yes. <laughs> it was so simple, Saladin. I am amazed at a man of your attainment. I think I know. Well, I shall show you very soon. You will not tell anyone about it, I think. I wonder. They they said there was no clue to the crash, Saladin. Yes. Would you like to know how? I think I know. Oh? Well. You too know something of black magic? I know a great deal of black magic, my friend. Shall I show you? I... Are, are you afraid of snakes, Saladin? No, Eric. Let us see. This bit of paper. Twist it. So. And you see it is but paper, Saladin. But now, look at it. A cobra. You are clever, Alec. But look now. Harmless paper again. <laughs> No. <laughs> I am not entirely powerless, Alec, even though my hands are bound. How did you? I thought that only one man in the world... That's I am the man, Alec. Look at the paper closely again. I fear I underestimate. <laughs> you see? It really is the snake, Alec. Curse you! I'll have your heart for that. Perhaps. But perhaps you had better get to your zombies again. Zombies? How did you know? It is possible that I read your mind, Ellie. So? Well, you have guessed it. I told that fool Warner that I would smash every one of his planes. Now, even now, he is about to lose another. So? And how do you propose to do it, may I ask? <laughs> read my mind, Sanity. You challenge me? Yes. Very well, then. I read this. A living dead man is at the controls of the ship you intend to destroy. <gasps> I do not know how you propose to control him. A ah, radio. <laughs> so he is to crash the ship full of passengers near an airport where all can see. I wonder... Saladin, until now I have regarded you as a meddler. A man foolishly staking his life against great odds. I am not so sure of the odds now. Saladin, you and I... No, Alec. Between you and me, there can be nothing but enmity. We are set apart to fight one another forever. Between us, we could rule the world. Tomorrow, Saladin. No, between us, there is always war. Well... So be it, then. But look for no mercy from me. I will kill you as I would a rat, Saladin. Agreed, if you can. LeBlanc in trip five. LeBlanc in trip five. To Chicago. Special weather report, please. LeBlanc in five. Five for Chicago. So, the first contact. That is the ship, then? That is the ship, yes. That did not sound like the voice of a zombie, Alan. No. <laughs> That is Miller, the co-pilot. He does the bidding of my dead man. So, and now the little drama begins. Will you listen? It is your drama. Now. Quite so, my friend. I must get to work. Alec, calling pilot up in trip five. Back me airline. Alec, calling pilot up in trip five. Back me airline. Out in trip five. I hear you. Give your position. Five miles 
southeast of Chicago. Good. You will do as I tell you. I will do as you tell me. Who is speaking, please? What is enough from you? Be silent. Yes, sir, but... You are under pilot out's orders, LeBlanc. You will do as you are told. Who are you, Sacre? Be silent. Yes, sir, but... Yes, sir. Now, up. When you arrive above the Chicago airport, you are to circle the field three times full motor. I am to circle the field three times full motor. And then when I give the word, you are to climb to 2,000 feet. I am to climb to 2,000 feet. And then I will tell you when. You will tell me when. And you will dive the ship full motor into the ground in the center of the field. I will dive the ship full motor into the center of the field. That is all. I know. Who is it that makes the... Silence him. Uh, oh. <laughs> You have thought of everything, Eric. <laughs> yes, this pilot, he died two weeks ago. I secured his body. You add grave robbery to your other crimes. But of course, I must have one that was a pilot. And he obeys without question, you see. So far, yes. But you have not won yet. I am close enough, Saladin. I wonder. Hut, report your position. Southwest of Chicago Airport. I can see the field. Good. You are ready? I am ready. Your co-pilot? He is here. He will not interfere. <laughs> report when you are over the field. I will report when I am over the field. Alec, what would you do if I told you, zombie, what to do? Hot. You are to obey only Alec's commands. I will obey only Alec's commands. Do you mind if I talk to him? Go ahead and try. Leblanc. Leblanc. Who calls? Do you hear me, Leblanc? I hear you. Est-ce que vous avez un morceau de serre? De serre, monsieur? De serre, oui. Peut-être, monsieur, mais pourquoi? Stop. What did you say to him, Saladin? I... You do not speak French, then, Alec? I... Of course. Certainly. Then you know that I asked him merely if there was anything he could do. And he replied that he could not. Of course. I... But why did you... I'm afraid that you are about to win, Nelly. Ah, you admit it, then. I am sorry. It is too late now. It is too late, Saladin. I offered to join forces with you once. But now I am the master. Art reporting. I am over Chicago Airport now. Good. Begin your circle. I will begin my circles. Now, friend Saladin, we shall see. Perhaps we shall even hear the scream, the dying screams of the passengers in this doomed ship. It is a wonderful invention, this radio. True magic. Yes, it is true magic. You will tell me when you are ready, Alec. I will tell you. Make your circle. I am making a circle. Do they see you on the field below? Many people are coming out to watch. Good. We will give them a show. <laughs> we will give them a show. Les Blancs. Les Blancs. Oui, monsieur. <laughs> you may speak to him as you wish, Saladin. It is too late now, and he is powerless. Yes, I am afraid so, but... Les Blancs, avez-vous des serres? Oui, monsieur. Il y a des petits grès ici de mon déjeuner, mais pourquoi? Écoutez, le pilote, c'est un loup garou. Ah, c'est vrai, monsieur, mais... Écoutez, mettez le serre sur ses lèvres. Dans sa bouche, comprenez? Vite, mon. <laughs> there is nothing you can do, Leblanc. Art, are you ready? I am ready. Vite, mon. Vite, mon, Leblanc. Here, Mr. Art, uh, taste a little of the salt. Salt? What have you... Listen. Take over, Mr. Leblanc. What? I take over. My work is done. Art! Art, come back. Come back, I say. No. My work for you is done. I go now. I go home. Come back. Come back. Come back, I say. Monsieur, I wish you a sleep time, monsieur. So, you did it, eh, Saladin? I did it, yes. So, well, you have beaten me again. But this time... It is too late, Harry. You think so? You do not know, Alec. I know that... There he is, Barry! Fool, you will not take him! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! 
You are too late, gentlemen. I doubt that even Ehrlich could survive a 40-story fall. Monsieur! Where are you, monsieur? Where are you? I am here, Leblanc. What happened? Monsieur, when I did put the sword on his lips, as you tell me of what he did say to me, take over. Yes, we heard him. Is the plane all right? It is under control. I, I am circling. Where is off? Where is the pilot? I do not know. He left his seat and went aft. I'm a one. Somebody is not right. Leblanc, what is it? It is a cabin door. Someone has opened it. <gasps> Leblanc, what happened? Monsieur, the pilot, he, he jumped out. He is falling. He is going to land on the long runway. Leblanc, is your plane still all right? Yes. I am all right. But I... I cannot land now. You, you understand. I, I will circle until I contact the control tower. Of course, Leblanc. What is happening on the field? People are running out toward the... Oh, oh dear, I, I... Quick, Leblanc, what is it? I do not believe what my eyes see that... Broken dead body on the runway. Every bone in it must be smashed, but. but yes, Leblanc. What is it? That body, monsieur. It is crawling toward the cemetery that stands beside the field. All right. You can turn them on now. You have just heard Lights Out. This was the fourth in the series of revivals of the best stories of this famous series. In tonight's cast, you heard Everett Clark as Saladin, Tony Parrish as Ehrlich, Meg Hahn as Irene, Duke Watson as Mr. Warner, Boris Aplon as Ott, Nathan Davis as LeBlanc, and Ernest Andrews as the radio operator. India is the setting of our story next Saturday night. You'll hear how a British sahib, wise in the ways of the Orient, wreaks a terrible revenge on a Chicago gangster who has wronged him. Of course, if you don't want to be scared stiff, you can always listen to something else. But if you're around about this time next Saturday night, tune in. Lights Out is produced and directed by Albert Cruz. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. in a spectrum of the universe. When he ventures beyond this limit, he is in the unknown, a realm where strange forces are brought into play. When man attempts to misuse these forces, he is sometimes destroyed. This is Macabre. <laughs> The Far East Network presents, in special performance, Macabre. Tonight's story, The Midnight Horseman. Ladies and gentlemen, if you will step down this corridor, I will show you some of the newer paintings which have just arrived. Really, Roderick, that's all I've heard about since I married you. The house looks like an art gallery now. Come on, Belle. Let's see what the man has. Jason, you and Ella are with us? Yes, Rod. Thanks to you, I know every art dealer in town personally. Don't be so hard on the boy, Ella. Boy, he shops for paintings as you would for hats. Who knows? Someday he might find a lost Rembrandt. Ha! Ladies and gentlemen, here is the find of the century. The artist is an unknown Oliver Turnquist. It is called The Lake. What is the price? Uh, Its value has not yet been determined. It was part of an estate sale we purchased recently in Europe. I should say in the neighborhood of 
$10,000. Notice the clean strokes of the brush, the kind of security. In the corner. Do you see that? No. Where? The picture of a knight on horseback. What do you do whispering about? Yes, I see it. Uh, may we see the painting of the horseman? The horseman? Yes, the uh, old canvas in the corner. Oh. The one with the knight. Ah, uh, that one. Uh, th- that really is not for sale. It shouldn't even be out here. Then why is it on display? It, it, it was part of the state sale, I mentioned. A very sketchy background. A painter unknown. I, I, I intended to repack it. Oh, Jason, he's trying to be mysterious to up the price. Does it have a title? Yes, the, the Midnight Horseman. Dates from the 13th century. <laughs> what an ideal wedding present for you and Jason, Ella. It's ghastly. Besides, he hasn't asked me. She said that all Irishmen marry late in life. I'll get around to it, my dear, in time. May I have a closer look? I would prefer not to show this Mr. book. Mr. Brum, we just want to look. <sighs> Very well. But I cannot be responsible if you bring this on yourselves. Don't let him stick you now, Roderick. That's an old gag. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen. A portrait, one that should never have been painted. An old canvas, 700 some odd years. I ask you to examine it quickly and then allow me to put it away. Oh, Roderick, it's terrifying. You're not going to buy that. I won't have it in the house. I'm just looking at it, Bell. Magnificent. A black-hooded knight with a silver lance, seated on a white horse by it. It is supposed to have been posed by a knight about 1250 A.D. He was betrothed to the Princess Belinda when she was abducted and slain by a ruthless baron. Years afterward, he would search the inns by night in quest of the slayer. The legend grew. It was said centuries later that the flying hoofs of the midnight horsemen could be heard... Searching the countryside for his beloved Belinda and the cruel Baron. An interesting story, but I don't see why you should be so upset by it. You see, sir, the, the portrait's been in my possession about ten days. And it's hard to explain, but it seems to be more than just a portrait. I am afraid of it. Fine showmanship. That lad, Mr. Collin. He's just raised the price by at least ten thousand. Why, it's just awful. Sitting there with that black hood. He looks like a, a hangman. Roderick, I won't have it in the house, and that's final. Ah, good. I, I'll read Wait, it from... Mr. Blum, what do you think, Jason? For some reason, I think the man is actually frightened by his superstitious ignorance. The painting is a masterpiece. Nothing else. Buy it if you can. I'll give you 10000 Please, Mr. Winfield, you are a man of wealth, and I, I am but a poor dealer in the arts. Do not tempt me. I've got to have that portrait. Twelve thousand. Don't do it, Roderick, for my sake. Fifteen. My final bit. What do you say, Mr. Blond? <sighs> Hard bargain. Very well, if you must. Good boy, Roderick. Good boy. I do so with reluctance. They say that man makes his own hell. I hope you haven't just made your own. (sighs) Supper fit for a king, Belle. I'm going to hire that cook right out from under your pretty nose one of these days. (laughs) I'm glad you and Ella could stay, Jason. Uh, Brinkley? Yes, sir. We'll take our drinks in the library. Very well, sir. You girls join us? Oh, no, not with that picture in there, we won't. Go ahead. We have plenty of girl talk to catch up on anyway, don't we, Belle? Come on, Roderick. (laughs) It seems we're not very popular with the fair sex at the moment. Right, we'll see you later. Ah, wonderful girls, wonderful. I may just marry another one of these days. Now, don't get carried away. Hmm. What happened to the heat? Do you feel a chill? Hmm, since you mentioned it, yes. I'll have Brinkley check it out when he brings our drinks. Now, let's examine the prize. Where did you put it? It's already hung over the fireplace. Hmm. A magnificent find. Oh, you stole it at the price. There he sits. A hooded knight in black armor. Poised. Waiting. I see what the art dealer meant. Look, Roderick, at the lance he carries. I can almost understand Bloom's feeling... That he's more than a portrait. Yes. At any moment, you're expecting to hurl the lance. There's something about it, Jason. Take the hood. Can't see his face. But his eyes seem to burn right through. 
Yes. That proves my suspicion. Roderick, I think I know what's wrong with this portrait. Shall I serve the drink, sir? Yes, uh, Brinkley, bring them in. Uh, Brinkley, is there anything wrong with the heating system here in the library? Oh, why, no, sir. Then why is this room so cold? Strange, sir. It became this way shortly after you returned from the city today. I see. Thank you, Brinkley. That'll be all. Yes, sir. What do you make of that? My boy, I am going to spend the night by the portrait. I'll need my notes. There are Nella's car and your books on the occult. Jason, you about ready to leave? We've taken up these people's whole day. Ella, I am not going with you tonight. What? Ella, dear, drive home like a good girl now. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. You're spending the night here? I have a few notes to make. Jason Van Horn, you're heading for trouble. I'm psychic, you know. There's something wrong with that portrait. I'm warning you to leave it alone. Ella, Ella, will you go home? Ella, will you go home? Who do you think you are anyway? Well, let me tell you, it's just as well I didn't marry you. Take my notes out of the car before you leave. <laughs> She's a spirited little devil, isn't she? I think you should go with her and forget the whole thing. Roderick, my boy, leave old Jason alone now. I promise you that by morning we'll have some news. We'll know exactly why they're all afraid of the Midnight Horseman. Yes? It's all right. Oh. You uh, want to talk to Belle? Please, may I? Yes, Mr. Mullins. Are you, Belle? Thank you. Ella, are you all right? What's wrong? Is Jason still there? I guess so. We left him down in the library after you left. Why? Oh. Hey, God, what's eating her? Shh. Ella, is there anything wrong? It's hard to explain. I get those feelings. But I don't understand them myself, Belle. Jason's in trouble. Please ask Roger to look in on him. Why, of course, dear. Now, don't you worry about a thing. I'm sure he's fine, but we'll check just to make certain. Oh, thanks. Go back to sleep, dear. I'll call you tomorrow. Sure, thanks again. Good night. Good night. Now, what the devil was that all about? Ella's worried about Jason. Maybe you'd better go down and see if he is all right. What could happen in the library? He's probably asleep. Rod, would you mind looking? I told her you would. <sighs> I think it's high time she married Jason. Getting more like an old maid every day. Oh, Rod. All right. I'll go down to humor both of you. Guess I'll have to agree. That picture is causing too much trouble. Maybe it had better go. Hmm. Library door is still closed. I'm sound from in there. He must be asleep. I'll knock quietly on the door. Mr. Van Horn asks not to be disturbed, sir. Uh, Brinkley, what are you doing up? I have an upset stomach, sir. I went to the kitchen for a remedy. Did you check on Mr. Van Horn? No, sir. As I said, he asked not to be disturbed. When did you retire? About 11, sir. To your knowledge, is he still in there? Yes, sir. I have heard nothing since you left him last evening. Mm -hmm. We'd better have a look. Jason? Jason? Jason, are you in there? Perhaps we should go in, sir. Yes, frankly, perhaps we should. Strange. There seems to be no heat in the library. No light either. Don't turn it on yet. Although it shouldn't be off if he's working. Look around. Can you see him? No, sir. Something peculiar here. Jason. The portrait. It's no longer over the fireplace. Frankly, by the hearth. The shadow. Yes, I see it. It's sitting on the floor. Does that look like Jason to you? No, sir. Quick, the light. We may be too late. Oh, why, it's Mr. Van Horn sitting on the floor in front of the portrait. His, his eyes are open, sir. But he doesn't move. Is, is he dead, sir? We'll see. Hmm. Pulse is all right. No. Some kind of trance. Jason, snap out of it. Wake up. Uh, perhaps if we turn the portrait around, he seems to be staring at it. Go ahead. Try it. Uh, there, sir. Yes. He's stirring. Uh, 
What the... What's the matter here? Get us some brandy, Brinkley. Yes, sir. And remember, not a word of this to Mrs. Winfield. I quite understand, sir. Roderick, I thought I told what you... What time do you think it is? Oh, why, just a little after midnight. Now, what was that? It's nearly 4.30, Jason. I see. Thanks, Roderick. He was staring at the portrait. Apparently, among its accomplishments, is a strong hypnotic power. What did you find out? No wonder Blum didn't want to sell. He also knew the truth. Meaning? My boy, this was painted by a medieval alchemist, or a man with occult powers. An entire ritual is depicted in symbolism. I've copied it down on paper, see? Mm. What does it add up to? Just this. Give me a day to correct these figures. Tonight we'll perform an experiment that has waited through seven centuries for fulfillment. What are you talking about? Roderick Lamb. If I can duplicate this ritual faithfully, tonight, right here in the library, we may stand face to face with the real Midnight Horseman. the time. Nearly midnight. Everything is set. Portrait in a square facing north. We've drawn a circle around us. Each holds a fresh tree branch. Exactly at midnight, we recite the words. This is a rare moment, Rod. There's something unnatural about this, Jason. As a... as if we're trying to play God. The ritual wouldn't exist. That weren't meant to be used. All I did was buy a portrait. Now look how it turned out. If we're able to do this tonight, we'll go down in history as the first men to span seven centuries. You don't want to forget what that man is looking for. Shh. Midnight. Here we go. Ready? I don't like it at all. Good. That'll add tension. That's good. Hear the words, lad. Let's say them slowly... And clearly. Absalom. Bada. Geta. Rum. An. Jektai. Som. Hear anything? No. Just the clock. What went wrong? Let's see. Quick, drop your branch over the picture. I would forget that. Now the time is off. Sit very still. It may work yet. Jason, you believe in too many old wives' tales. Shh! Don't scoff at things you don't understand. It should begin with the sound of a cold wind. Then we'll hear the hoofbeats of a horse approaching. Just be patient, Roderick. It didn't work. Hmm. I can't understand what's wrong. I was so careful. Well... That's that for tonight. Wait. Do you hear it? The wind. He's coming. We've won. No. In a moment, he'll stand here as big as life. No, stop it, Jason. We did it, lad. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> you pulled the picture out of the square when we were so close. Why? Uh, I couldn't go through with it. It's unholy, Jason. We shouldn't be doing this. Lad, I'm disappointed in you. Now we'll have to pick another night. Start all over again. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Jason. You can try again tomorrow, if you like. Busy, then. Have to wait till the day after. Okay, the day after. All right, at least we are certain now. It's just a question of time until we meet the man in person in this very room. Frankly, there's no reason for you to remain up. Yes, sir. It's quite cool in the library. Shall I bring you a coat? No, thank you. Mr. Van Horn did not come tonight. That's right. It's nearly midnight, Brinkley. I don't want to be disturbed further. Yes, sir. I quite understand, sir. Ring if you need me, sir. Yes, sir. Good night. Good night. I wonder if I should try it by myself. Jason would be pretty disappointed if it worked, and he weren't here, though. <sighs> Cold in this room. 
Jason thinks it's caused by some field of force around the picture. The portrait, there it hangs above the fireplace. A hooded knight, like a hangman out of some distant nightmare. Bell's right. It is terrifying. Wait. Can't look away. I'm being hit to the... No, no, no. Jason's right. Let's tear up the horse. Lord, it's uncanny. It's the time. A minute to twelve. Should I try? Hmm. Why not? Don't worry, though. Take the picture down. <laughs> Sit on the floor. Ah. Well, that free branch. Oh, it's under the couch. There. Now, draw a square with it around. And circle around that. Picture faces north. Hmm. Now, what did I forget? Something else. Oh, yes. Draw a big circle around the picture and me. Okay. She just made it. The words. What the words? Oh, no, I'm so close. I'll come down. It must be somewhere. But where? It'll be too late in the moment. It must be recited at midnight. Ah, a pocket. That's it. That's it. Here they are. Quick. Read the words. Absam, Badha, Betha, Lum, An, Jetai, Son. Next time. Throw the branch on the portrait. There. Ah, the wind. I don't hear it. What did I do wrong? I didn't leave out a thing. It's supposed to work. Hmm. Might as well gather this stuff up and put it back, I guess. Wait. Wind. I did it. Hey. The room seems wavy. Is playing tricks on me. Of course. It's sudden. Like a hole. Yes, the moves. He's coming. And like horse, but he's heading right for this room. Oh, the room is so weird. Feel the force in the portrait. Should I stop him? All I can. How do I know he won't kill? I can pull the picture out of the square and stop him. What? What should I do? <laughs> hey, oh! Ron! Oh, Ron, darling! Are you all right? Are you all right? Well, you spoil the whole thing. I was looking outside and I heard everything. Please, darling, stop this while you can. I'm so afraid. I thought you were asleep. You, you weren't supposed to know anything about it. Oh, what you're doing is evil. But I haven't done a thing yet. You can and would if I hadn't stopped you. Oh, I, I'm confused. I haven't seen a thing. All, all that's happened is the sound. Oh, we're lucky that's all that happened. I'm sorry, darling. Here, dry the tears. Promise me, Rod. Promise me you won't try it again. I can't. Oh, you'll be sorry. Make a deal with you. First, I want to see a smile, though. No. Yes, come on. A big one. Oh, Rod. Hold me close. <sighs> That's better. Poor little girl. You were frightened. Make a deal with you. Okay. What is it? Tomorrow is Friday. Jason's coming over tomorrow night. We'll try once more. This time, if it doesn't work, we'll quit. What if it does? Are you game? Oh, Rod. I've got to find out. How about it? I'm against it. But if you must... Well, well, I want to be here with you. Check. Just one more time, then. I've got to find out if the Midnight Horseman can be brought into being. <laughs> Hello, is this Eric Blom? That's right. I'm Miss Ella Case. It's about the portrait you sold Roderick Winfield. It's quite late, Miss. Hart. They've read some kind of symbolism in it. They what? That's the reason I didn't want to sell it. Are you certain? Some ritual I believe they perform at midnight. Where? At the Winfields. For all I know, they may try again tonight. Good Lord, it's 11.30. What is your address, Miss Case? 246 Maple Drive. Not a moment to lose. Pick you up in ten minutes. If they bring that... Man, 
This is it, Bell and Rod. Nearly twelve. This time we go all the way. I'll let the servants off tonight so we won't be disturbed. Good. Are you ready, Bell? Yes. Get it over, Jason. And remember, this is the last time. I promised it would be. Take your places. When the clock strikes, throw your branches on the picture and recite the words. Come what may, we won't try to stop it. Oh, Rod. Take it easy, Bell. Everything's going to be all right. The branches. Quick! The words now. We'll read them together. Asom, Bada, Yeta, Lum, An, Jektai, Som. Shh. It should begin now. Listen. I wonder if it'll work again. It takes time. Listen. There it is. Horse! It's working! It's working! Rod, you can still stop him. Just the chance of a lifetime. Look, the room. It's getting waiting. Be quiet. In a moment, a man centuries old will stand before us. Living, breathing... I'm hating Bell, you promised. Stop him. It's our last chance. He'll kill us. You've got to stop him. Too late, Bell. That house is about to kite through those windows. I'll pull the picture out myself. Oh. Just like the portrait. Black armor. Black wood. Soft glance. The midnight horseman. My dreaming. What? He's pointing the lance at me. Thou hast fulfilled the prophecy. Know ye, I have found the beloved Belinda. He's taking bow. No! Thou knowest me well, Baron, without the hood. He raised the hood. No! Not you! Damn it, please! They are not the lions! Yes, he's been here. Look, the portrait. There's a change. The lance, it's missing. Good Lord. Buried in Roderick's heart. No, no. There's only a bloody hole. But, but where are Jason and Bell? The answer is in the portrait. Let me see. There's a girl riding behind the horseman. Oh, it's Bell. It's Bell. Yes. And the hood is now missing from the horseman. You can see his face. It's Jason. You have just heard Macabre, a special Far East Network presentation. Tonight's story was The Midnight Horseman. In our cast were John Buey as Jason, Frankie Oka as Belle, William Verdier as Roderick, Sandra Mori as Ella, Walt Sheldon as Eric Blum, and Milton Radmilovich as Brinkley. Technical supervision was by Airman First Class Larry Dooley, with sound patterns by Airman First Class James Conley. This is Air Force Sergeant Al LePage speaking. Macabre was written and directed by William Verdier.
macabre comes to you each week at this time through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Welcome to a half hour of Mind Webs. Short stories from the worlds of speculative fiction. The story this time is from the book Alien Horizons by William F. Nolan, a tale entitled Promises to Keep, a science fiction drama. It begins as a physician and nurse prepare to awaken Robert Murdoch, who is making a very special journey. Shall I wake the patient, Doctor? Yes, I'll speak to him now. What? Oh, oh uh, Dr. West, are, are the tests over? Everything's completed. Uh, you don't look too encouraging. Uh, just how bad am I? You're dying, Mr. Murdoch. There is no cure, no treatment. Now, if you were a Venusian, a Martian even, we'd have a chance of saving you. But as an Earthman, you have no immunity to the disease you've contracted. It is alien, 
And it is deadly. Well, uh, how long do I have, Doctor? In Earth time, how long? Exactly two months. You'll die at midnight on January 30th, 2022. The machines are never wrong about these things. Uh, I see. Now, I've made arrangements for you to remain with us until it... No, may... no, look, I, I'm going back home. To Earth? But that's impossible. From this planetary system, it's a year's journey. Twelve Earth months. You'll never reach there alive. Mm, you're wrong, Doctor. One year from today, Robert Spencer Murdoch, rocket man, star class, will return to the town he grew up in. To Thayerville, Haley County... State of Ohio, planet Earth, to keep a promise. I'm afraid that would require a scientific miracle. Exactly, Dr. West, exactly right. A genuine scientific miracle. Across a wilderness of stars, a silver needle threads the dark fabric of space. A one-man rocket aimed at the planet called Earth. Inside its metal skin, alone within the ship's honeycomb chambers, a man is dying. 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 Robert S. Murdoch, recording logbook entry January 29th, 2022, on board Starship 12, single passenger craft, 29th day out. Proceeding on schedule, star course 89J4. Anticipated Earth touchdown, December 31st, 2022. All is well. You are tired, Mr. Murdoch. You should rest. Rest uh, on my last day of life? Look, I want to savor every minute left to me. The concept does not register, Mr. Murdoch. <laughs> well, why should it? You're, you're dead computer metal, and I'm living flesh. Do you understand the concept of dreams? A machine cannot dream, sir. That's right, only a man can dream. I've had a dream for most of my life, a dream of space. From the moment I watched the first Mars rocket land, I knew, I knew beyond any possible doubt that I wanted to become a spaceman. Ah, oh, my, my boyhood pal, Jack Morgan, he shared the dream with me. You know, we'd hike out to the rocket port and stand for hours behind the fence watching those big passenger ships come down from the moon. And I'd yell with excitement, Look, 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 Jack, here, here it comes, the, the rocket. Here she comes, Jack. Isn't that a, isn't that a marvel? Yeah, yeah, she's beautiful. Oh, I'm going to ride one of those like her to the stars someday, Jack. I'm going to be a spaceman. Bet you won't. Not really. <laughs> Bet I will. Won't. Will. <laughs> My parents say it's all right, Jack. That They'll even be proud of me. Dad wanted to be an astronaut once, but he got sidetracked. Me? I'm really going. But won't it really take a long time? A lot of special schooling? Yeah, sure, but I don't mind that. It's what I really want to do. Well, me too. But I just wish my folks were like yours. They think I'm crazy when I talk about going into space. <laughs> well, look, maybe they know you don't want it as much as I do, Jack. It's all I dream about, reaching the stars, seeing alien horizons, other worlds. I've got to make it happen, Jack. I've got to. So I made it happen. I, I made the dream real. Finished my schooling, got my degree, became a space engineer. I left home for the stars at 22 with a promise. A promise, Mr. Murdoch? That's right, a promise to come back to Thayerville, to, to see my parents again, to let them be with their son once more. They're waiting for me now. And because they didn't let me down... I, I won't let them down. How does that poem by Robert Frost go? 
But I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. And miles to go before I sleep. But aren't your parents aware of your condition? I kept it from them. They're old, sick, and their friends are gone. Why bring more sorrow into their lives? They think I'm fine, that I'm coming back to them. That last tape Mother sent from Earth, telling me that she and Dad are waiting. We're mighty anxious for you to come home to us, Robert. Your father and I are so eager to see you again. We're happy for you, son, and proud of what you've accomplished. We haven't been too well of late. Your father's heart doesn't allow him to get out much anymore, and I'm so short of breath lately, yet. Dr. Thomas says that you're not to worry, that we're both quite well enough considering our ages. We're resting as much as possible, saving our strength for your homecoming. Oh, please, Bobby, come back to us safely. The thought of you fills each day like sunshine, and our lives are suddenly bright again. Hurry, please. Hurry. Hurry. Oh, it's time. The hours, the minutes are running out. It's time now. Oh, just inside here, they said he'd be waiting for me. Good evening, Mr. Murdoch. Incredible. A absolutely incredible. How may I serve you, sir? Tell me who you are. I, I, I want to hear you say the words. My name is Robert Spencer Murdoch. I'm a professional rocket man trained in astro engineering. I'm 44 years of age and have been in space for half my lifetime. I'm presently on leave from my star-class duties, and I'm bound for my home planet Earth to visit my parents, as I promised them I would. After two decades among the stars, I'm going back to Fayerville, Ohio. Perfect. As you say, sir. Why, your eyes, my eyes. Your voice, my voice. Your nose, mouth, chin, hair, all mine. Exactly and precisely mine. I've been built to your specifications, sir. You'll find that we are identical in every outward detail. You eat, drink, sleep? Of course, sir. Your habits are my habits. Your body functions are duplicated within my body. I assure you, there are no flaws. Let me see your hands. Y your fingers. Uh, yes, each... Each pore, the, the same. Nothing short of an extensive lab exam by a medical expert could reveal my true origin. And my memories are mine. Your human brain's entire neural pattern has been electronically imprinted in my android brain. So I remember what you remember. The warm summers of Ohio, picnics in the fields with that... Special potato salad your mother was so proud of. The nights on the back porch when you'd sit with Jack watching the stars. And Julie, do you remember... Do you remember her? She loved you, but she fought your dream. She wanted me to give up the stars, the rockets. Julie didn't want me to become a spaceman. Oh, how she fought to keep me on Earth... Happy, Bob. I swear it. You'll see. I'll make you a fine wife. We'll have two children, a boy and a girl, and we'll raise them here in Thayerville. I love you, Bob, so much. And I love you, Julie, but I, I can't stay with you. I, I can't be tied to Earth. I need the stars, Julie. I need deep space, the, the rockets. I'm going out to them. I must. But this is your home. The people who love you are here. 
I'm here. I won't wait for you, Bob. I can't do that. You know, I, I'd never ask you to wait, Julie. I, I could be gone for decades. Maybe I'll never come back. I have no way of knowing. Then go. Forget me. Forget that I ever loved you. I'll never do that, Julie. I'll always remember you and, and what we had together, Julie. Always. Always. And you've never forgotten her. We've never forgotten her. Julie left Thayerville after I did. Left the States, went to Europe, married a schoolteacher in Switzerland, became a mother. She has a grown son and daughter by now. I doubt she ever thinks much about Robert Murdoch. <sighs> but you wouldn't know about that. No, sir, I wouldn't. Well, how much longer? You have until midnight, Earth time. Hmm. Doctors can tell exactly when my breath will cease, chart the precise moment my heart will stop beating. They can do everything but keep me alive. I'm sorry, sir. No, damn it, you're not. A machine can't feel sorrow. If you've never had life, you can't know how it feels to lose it. As you say, sir. Well, I want to go over everything with you now. There must be no error. However small, we must be certain of success. When this rocket touches down next December, I'll be here to meet your parents. They know in advance from your tapes that I cannot spend longer than two weeks with them. Then I must return to my duties. But for those two weeks, I'll be their son, home from the stars... For those two weeks, I'll live with them, eat with them, sleep in the back of the house in my old room. I'll talk to them of the far places I've been. I'll tell them of other planets, of other races beyond Earth. Yes, they'll want to hear all of it about my work in space, the strange adventures I've had, the friends I've made, all of it. But, but when you leave them, when the two weeks are up, they must believe you're going back into space. They'll see me board a rocket. They'll see it fire away from Earth. They'll know that I cannot return for two more decades. They won't try to stop me. They'll say their goodbyes and let me go back to the stars. And the tapes. My voice. All arranged. Your pre-recorded tapes will be sent to them in Thayerville at selected intervals until their deaths. They'll never know the truth. <laughs> yeah... Yes, my promise will be kept. I'll never have to deal with th this, this, uh, this alien thing that's killing me. <clears throat> now, now everything is, is set, perfect. Are you ready now, Mr. Murdoch? It's almost midnight. Yes, yes. Oh, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Then follow me, please. Here we are, sir. You have only uh, a few moments left. Uh, I'm tired. I'm so very, very tired. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's ironic, me dying at midnight. Space is one eternal midnight, always black, dark, and deep, and eternal. Lie down, sir. Easy. Easy now. Thank you, Robert, Robert Murdoch, for what you're now about to do and, and for all you will do. I was built to serve, sir. I, I have always, I, I've always wanted to, to, to die in space, to be buried here, to, to float forever between the stars. I... I'm so tired now. I, my eyes feel so heavy. Close them and sleep, Mr. Murdoch. Sleep. Uh, goodbye, Mom, Dad, Julie. I, I loved all of you. I, I, I loved you. Sleep well.
well, Mr. Murdoch. They were all there. The mayor, old Mr. and Mrs. Murdoch, the town's banker, Mr. Hartley, the Fairville High School band, citizens young and old, waiting on a cold, bright Ohio morning for a man to come down from the stars. Uh, there he comes. Look, look. Oh, Lordy, what a sight. Hey, it's beautiful. Spencer Murdoch, tall and heroic, in a splendid dress uniform that threw back the light of the sun in a thousand glittering diamond patterns. Across the field, moving toward the rocket, a white-haired woman and a man with a cane. Bobby! Son, you Bobby. come back to us! Bob, Dad... Oh, I'm so glad to be home. Everybody's here, son, even the mayor. All the city officials. This is a great day for Thayerville. Well, Mr. Mayor, there they go, the three of them. Still doesn't seem altogether right to me, Hartley. Unnatural. That's the feeling I get. This is what they wanted, isn't it? What they asked for. It's what they wrote in their wills. They didn't want their son to come home and find them gone. They promised to meet him, and they've kept that promise. Doesn't seem right somehow. In just two weeks, he'll be back into deep space for another 20 years. Why ruin his homecoming? Why bring sorrow into his life? And they are perfect, aren't they? No doubt about that. They're perfect duplicates. It's amazing these days what science can do. Look at him, embracing them, chattering to them, smiling. He's happy, and he'll never know. You're right, Mr. Hartley. He'll never know. And the old woman and the old man and their tall son from the stars walked off together into the white winter streets of Thayerville, Haley County, State of Ohio, Planet Earth, 2022. The story this time was by William F. Nolan from his book Alien Horizons. We did Promises to Keep, a science fiction drama. This is Michael Hansen speaking. Reading with me were Jay Fitz, Cliff Roberts, Carrie Frumpkin, Ward Paxton, and Louise Strasbaugh. Engineering by Steve Gordon. Mindwebs is a production of WHA Radio in Madison, a service of University of Wisconsin Extension.
Stop. Don't move. I want to talk to you. Yes, you who remain in your hot little rooms, never venturing out beyond your neighborhood. Are you afraid? Are you afraid of the strange and turbulent things that happen in distant lands, in places outside your own ken? For example, are you afraid of the sounds that a South American swamp makes? Yes, a swamp does make noise, you know. A selfish noise. A sucking noise. As if it were anxious to draw you to it. And hold you there. Forever. Or is it the sound of a... The sound of a knife whisking across the room in a squalid house in Baghdad. Or is it the sound of the wind... as it cuts through the snowy Caucasus, kept company by... a single rifle shot of a guerrilla fighter. Now come, tell me. What are you afraid of that keeps you in your hot little room? Oh, you're, you're not afraid at all. It's just, just that you haven't the time to travel. You haven't the time to become mixed up in some adventure way off in Mesopotamia or Ecuador. Or even the county jail. Well, I can understand you're not having time, but you don't have to travel, you know, to live through these adventures. For they'll be brought right into your hot little room, your safe little room, by means of your radio. So, listen to a familiar voice. A voice you know well. A voice you can trust. While he tells you how you can stand by for adventure. You there, striking a match. I warn you to be careful and keep your eye on the flame. A flame is not flame alone, you know. A flame has a spirit and a personality of its own. It might jump off that matchstick and leap across the room with no good purpose in mind. Did you say that was hard to believe? Well, perhaps... Dr. Juan Avillo can convince you better than I. Como están mis amigos? This is Dr. Juan Avillo speaking. I hope you weren't taken aback by that strange introduction. And if I were you, I wouldn't ignore it either. For an unusual thing happened to me, which I will tell you about in the Stand By for Adventure series. The story of the flame spirit. I can even remember it now. I was standing in a jungle clearing with a water hose in my hand. This flame thing that looked like a man was rushing toward me. I played the stream of water on him and he fell to the ground. I kept the water running until every 
crackling tongue of flame was silent. And then I rushed to the spot where he fell. I was sure it was a trick. That this flame thing was only a man who was wearing as best of clothing so that fire would not harm him. I was sure that I would find his flesh and blood body on the grass. But when I came to the spot, he was not there. The flame spirit was flame, and flame alone. And what I saw was only the charred grass. Charred where he fell, pitch of a man. That is one of the many experiences I had and which I shall tell you about. Most of my stories will concern themselves with the occult and the metaphysical, for the worlds beyond our own have always fascinated me. I don't ask you to take my word for all I tell you. I only ask you to remember that I am an educated man. I was educated in Oxford and the Sorbonne, in culture, traveled, and, if you will pardon the cliché, sophisticated as well. I am the host of these intimate gatherings of my three friends and myself. We are very good friends, you know, and uh, not young anymore. We enjoy these meetings together, reliving the past, breathing youth into all memories. I always make my friends comfortable. I assure you that you too shall be made comfortable if you care to listen in on our story. Now, perhaps you should like to hear from Major Gordon. Arnold Moss is standing by to introduce me. Remember the last night you couldn't sleep? Remember the way you tossed and turned and perspired? Well, suppose you couldn't sleep for a week or a month or a year. Suppose you couldn't sleep forever. Major Gordon knew such a man, so stand by for adventure. Hello, everyone. Yes, it's true I knew such a man, a man who couldn't sleep. My experiences as a soldier of fortune and army officer have thrown me into contact with many unusual people. I met this man in question while I was attached to the Chinese army as a liaison officer. And I learned later that he was directly responsible for the death of an arrogant enemy commander who had conquered a territory in which this man lived. Shortly afterwards, this enemy commander began finding poison in his food, snakes under his pillow, time bombs in his closet. No matter where he turned, no matter what he did, he always discovered some clever device to take his life. A dozen times a day, he narrowly escaped death. In despair, he once shouted, What sort of a man is this that haunts me? How does he get the time to plan these fiendish schemes? He must never sleep. How true. His adversary never slept. In a duel between a normal man and one who doesn't sleep, what chance has the normal man? The man who doesn't sleep has so much time. Well... That is one of many stories I shall tell you in this standby for adventure series. Stories of armies in the field and heroic civilians who fought side by side with their soldiers for liberty and security. But now I think I ought to relinquish this microphone to Arnold Moss, who will introduce Mr. Richard Moore. Take a man, an old man, and place him in a cell. Lock the door tightly behind him. Make sure the iron door is bolted. Now, you'd think, wouldn't you, that the sickly old man could do no one any harm. He looks powerless behind those bars. But don't fool yourself. Someone will die before morning. But Richard Moore knows more about it than I, so stand by for adventure. This is Richard Moore speaking. I have had a pretty full career as a newspaper man. I guess my press past has been more a ticket to adventure than anything else. But the funny thing is... No matter where my syndicate sends me, I invariably get mixed up in a murder. <laughs> don't get the wrong idea there. I mean, I don't commit murders. I just stumble over murderers, like the case just presented. You see, they had locked this old man in his cell after a futile attempt to question him. He was already suspected of one murder. In an effort to learn something, a police officer posed as a criminal and was locked up in the same cell. The old man did not move from his bunk all night, yet morning found the police officer dead, poisoned. They searched the old man, but to no avail. He had been carefully examined before he entered the cell, too. Then uh, I volunteered to spend the night in the cell. I had an idea, and my hunch was correct. In the middle of the night, I was awakened by the patter of tiny feet. But uh, I tell the complete story in the program called uh, Death is My Cellmate. So, oh, there's no point telling it to you now. Well, I guess I've hogged this stage long enough. 
I'm sure you'll want to hear what Captain Quigley has to say. As usual, Arnold Moss does the honors in his own inimitable way. What sort of noise does a sea monster make? No, no, that's a boat. No, 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 that's a train. Of course not. Anyone would know that that's an automobile horn. I guess none of us has quite the imagination of Captain Quigley, so we'll just have to be patient and stand by for adventure. Now, listen here, young fella. If you're insinuating that my imagination is a mite too strong, let it pass. Hello, folks. This is Captain Quigley talking. No other. Now, I'm just as skeptical a man as any afloat or on land, and I don't believe things easy myself. But there's no sense avoiding the issue. I really did see that sea monster. Lady monster it was, on account of no whiskers on her face. And I'll tell you something else, too, about that monster that would be hard to believe. That is, if I hadn't seen it myself. That sea monster was cultured. Yes, sir. Cultured. Now, I don't suppose they have colleges for sea monsters, but this one could read. Yep. First she read over my shoulder, but that wasn't so comfortable... So I propped up the paper on a rag, so as I could read one side and she the other. Particular sea monster she was, too. Didn't want to read the jokes, only the editorials. Do I hear somebody raising any doubts? Well, I can't blame you if you are. I'm only giving half the story, mind you. When you hear all of it, you'll realize how true it is. I'll be able to convince you in just the time it'll take to tell the story of the cultured monster. And that ain't the only story I'll tell, either. I once had a very unusual boat. Now, I know it's hard to believe, but this boat would never react properly to having her machinery oiled unless the oil had a vegetable base. You see, the boat was a vegetarian. Well, I could go on this way all day, but I guess it's time to say goodbye now, so here's that skeptical young fellow again. And that's a thumbnail radio sketch of all four friends. There is Dr. Juan Avillo, famous South American scientist and philosopher, and Major Gordon, retired army officer and soldier of fortune. And Richard Moore, correspondent adventurer. And finally, Captain Quigley, merchant mariner, who sailed the seven seas. These four friends meet often at the home of Dr. Juan Adillo. When they meet again and talk again, they invite you to listen in and stand by for adventure. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre, presented by Camel Cigarettes. This, dear friends, was the man Philip Gentry, or Reverend Pierce, or whatever other name he may choose in eternity the man whom we bury today. That night when he stood above my bed, pouring defiance and bitterness into my ears, thinking that I was paralyzed, I could both speak and write. My paralysis had been gone for many days. But I did not speak, because I knew what Philip Gentry would do, what he had to do, criminal and murderer, though he was. Each week at this hour, Peter Lorre brings us the excitement of the great stories of the strange and unusual, of dark and compelling masterpieces culled from the four corners of world literature. Tonight, Beyond Good and Evil, starring Peter Lorre, brought to you by Camel Cigarettes. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking camels than ever before. 
Yes, try a camel. Let your T-zone decide. That's T for taste and T for throat. Your proving ground for any cigarette. Let your T-zone decide if camel's rich, full flavor and cool mildness aren't just made to order for enjoyment. Yes, try a camel. And be sure to have a carton of camels on hand for the long weekend coming up. Why, Reverend Pierce. Well, uh, Good evening. Good evening, Lucy. Is Reverend McKillop still awake? Oh, yes. We don't put him to bed until later, later. Is evening service over already? Is it over? <laughs> Shame on you, Lucy, a parson's daughter, and you forget there is no service on Wednesdays. Of course. You've come to read to Father. Well, there's so little I can do. Uh, if he were able to let us know in some way... I can know. tell by his eyes. Whenever you're here, they fairly glow. Oh, I, I suppose that helpless as he is, not able to speak or even to write, my my visits are at least a diversion. You're much more than a diversion. Mm. You're his hope. No, Lucy. The Lord is his hope. Oh, yes. The Lord struck him down with paralysis, and, and in time the Lord will surely free him from it. Well, I'll go in and try to cheer him up. Good evening, Reverend McKillop. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Yes, McKillop, you hang on my every word, and, and you never talk back. You never have, except once, and, and after tonight you won't get the chance. Huh? Speak up, Reverend, why don't you? No, of course, the cat's got your tongue, huh? Yes, tonight is your last chance, Reverend. Tonight is the consummation, finish, the end, act three curtain on a great play about death and redemption, about good and evil. And I won't shrink from your eyes, McKillop, see? Your eyes can't kill, but I can kill. I have the mind and the will and the hands. I've killed one man, that you know. And tonight, tonight I'm going to kill again. <laughs> Yes, Reverend McKillop, you know who I was before I became the Reverend Howard Pierce, pastor of this good and godly community. And you know my real name, it's Philip Gentry, but, but you never knew the soul of Philip Gentry, the, the contempt, the sum of evil that was in me that night. It all began, yes, it's, it's now three months ago. What a stormy night. I, I was crouching in a swamp with a man named Mac. Because we had just escaped from prison, hiding like animals in the deep mud and ooze, alien from the whole entire human race. Gentry, where are you going? The highway, you idiot. Got to make time before daylight. Before the rain stops. They'll bring out the bloodhounds in the morning. Yeah, okay, okay, you're the boss. There's the highway now. There, beyond the fence. Well, so what do we do now? Where do we go? It's played up. I'll meet you in Chicago later. Yeah, at Gus's place? Yes, at Gus's place in two or three weeks when a manhunt cools on. You, you won't let me down, will you, Gentry? I said I'll meet you. Now get moving. Go on, fast. I walked a mile and, and then I saw a car. It, it was parked close to the edge of the road. Its, its headlights almost blacked out by the rain and... And then, by the glow of what I knew was a flashlight, I, I saw a man bending into the rain, struggling to change a tire. He, he was alone, so I walked up to him. Hello. Need help? Oh, oh, you startled me. I'm sorry. I didn't expect to see anyone this late. Picked a bad night for a flat. Huh? Yes, and it's the second today. I'm going to be awfully late. Here, uh, come on, let me help. Oh, no, 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 thank you. But if you would hold the light. Oh, sure, Come a long way? Uh, yes, from Detroit. I, I'm on my way to Carlton. I Carlton. was supposed to get there this afternoon. I'm the new minister there. Uh, my name's Pierce. Didn't notice you were a preacher. Yes, I'm taking over for old Reverend McKillop at Grace Church. Reverend He's McKillop been in Grace bad health, Church. so I'm taking his place. Yes. Oh, my, this, this boat is stubborn. I, I, I can't seem to get it. To Come on, let me have the wrench. Uh, no, no, really, just, just hold the light. I said give me the wrench. Well, all right, it's awfully good of you. Come on, give it to me. No, 
No, no, no, wait. I need wait, your you car, Everett. No, he is. no, You're please. going to be please. eaten later no. than no. you thought. No. Oh. Be no. quiet, no. you... I hit him twice, and I can't tell you now, Reverend McKillop, what I thought when it wrenched Bick into flesh and bone, or I swear to you that it was not my intention to kill, and, and yet I... I did. I, I killed, yes. When I put my hand on his chest, the heart had stopped, and, and the Reverend Howard Pierce was dead. Yes, Reverend Pierce was dead. <laughs> Very dead, so, so I buried him. I buried him in my prison clothes, and soon I, I was dressed in his clothes. Oh, I had on his decent black and turned around collar, and, and I was rolling this way. And at the city limits of Carlton, my own destiny stepped in. I was stopped by a traffic cop. Let me see your license, buddy. A license? Oh, yeah, I... I'm a, here. Here it is. Uh, Howard Pierce. Occupation. Hmm? Oh, minister. <laughs> I didn't notice. Well, what is it, officer? Was that speeding? No, no, we're checking all cars on this road. There was a break at the state pen. Two prisoners escaped. Yes. They might come this way. I see. But I won't hold you up any longer, Reverend. You uh, going far? Oh, no. Uh, Carlton. Well, say, this is Carlton. It is? <laughs> oh, yes, there's the sign. Say, I get it. <laughs> Imagine me not catching on right away. Catching on? Sure, oh. you must be the new preacher for Grace Church. Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> well, I'm Charlie Owen. I, oh, I yeah. sing in the Grace Church choir, baritone. Oh. Uh, you going to the parsonage now? Yes, I was. Well, it's a little tricky finding it. I'm going into headquarters now, and I have to go right by Reverend McKillop's house. Oh, that's nice. You follow me. Thank you, son. It's very nice of you. Lucy? Why, hello, Charlie. Guess who I'm delivering to you? It's Reverend Pierce. He's just getting out of the car. Who are you expecting, Lucy? The boyfriend? You mean my fiancé, Mr. Tom Hubbard? <laughs> when are you two going to get married, anyway? You know, everybody in... Oh, here's Reverend Pierce. Uh, Reverend Pierce, here's Lucy, Reverend McKillop's daughter. How do you do? Oh, come in, come in, Reverend Pierce. Father and I have been so worried. We expected you all afternoon. Oh, I had two flat tires. Oh, what a shame. Well, Father's waiting up for you in his study. Father, Charlie Owen brought Reverend Pierce. Reverend Pierce? Well, come in, come in. Uh, you and Mr. Owen wait outside for a few minutes, Lucy. All right, sure, Father. Sure, sir. <laughs> Sit over here, Reverend Pierce. Thank you, sir. I can't tell you how relieved I am to see you. I really couldn't bring myself to sleep tonight without first talking to you. You see... The situation's serious. Situation's serious. Why, Reverend? My health. I'm a sick man. I've had one stroke as I wrote you. Oh, yeah. I know. Yeah. Well, I could have another one at any time. Okay. The doctor says a worse one. And I feel it essential that the work of the parish should be in firm hands. This parish needs a young man. Well, I, I hope to be of service, sir. I've heard only good of you, Reverend Pierce. Thank you. And you know you're even younger than you look. Oh, really? In the picture you sent. Uh, mm -hmm. Darker, too. Your, your hair. I'm afraid it, uh, it wasn't a very good liking. I have the picture here somewhere on my desk with your letters. What did you want uh, to talk to me about, Reverend McKillop? Oh, all the work of the parish. Oh, yes, here's the photograph. It's, uh, it... Something Reverend wrong, Pierce. Reverend McKillop? It's not... Who it's are you? Not what? This isn't your picture. Who are you? I don't think that should interest you. It's... Something's, something's happened, Reverend, Reverend Pierce. McKillop. What did you do to him? You're... What? You're... What do you think I did, uh, Reverend McKillop, huh? Uh, Come on, go on, guess. Guess, don't you hear me? Come on, don't you play with me, you you uh, sanctimonious fool. You, Come on, speak up. Speak up. What's the matter with you? Oh, don't tell me you had another stroke, huh? That's right. You, you can't speak, huh? Is that it? Well, I'll find out. And in any case, I'll take that picture, Reverend McKillop. And, and now, if Reverend you don't... Reverend Pierce, we thought... Oh. Yes, Lucy, I... Something has happened to your father. We, we were talking and... Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm afraid it's another stroke. He, he can't speak and apparently he can't move. Father. Father. What can we do? Lucy, we, we'll have to wait for the doctor and, and maybe even then. I know. The doctor said he could be paralyzed for months, years. He mustn't die. No. 
No. If we have faith, the Lord will spare him. And, and until the good Lord returns his health, uh, I'll try to shepherd his flock. Yes, and, and since that first time, Reverend McKillop, you've never opened your mouth again. Oh, you can stare, yes. Stare as hard as you want. That doesn't bother me. Because your stare cannot kill. But, but I, as you know, I can. And I will, Reverend McKillop. <laughs> Moments, Mr. Peter Lorry will bring us the climax of tonight's mystery in the air when camels present Act Two of Beyond Good. And ask a sports champ in any field what helped him most toward success, and he'll probably say experience. Yes, experience is the best teacher. Take bronc riding champ Jerry Ambler. His most recently won sports crown is the saddle bronc championship of the world. Experience. Why, say, Jerry's been riding Bronx for 18 years. Yes, as he recently said, experience is the best teacher in Bronx riding and in smoking, too. The cigarette for me is camel. And there, Jerry's like thousands and thousands of other cigarette smokers who smoke just about all the different brands during the wartime cigarette shortage. Well, experience like that was bound to make people experts in judging the differences in cigarette quality. And on the basis of that experience... Thousands and thousands of people decided they liked camels best. Yes, they learned that for rich, full flavor and cool mildness, the cigarette for them is camel. As a result, more people are smoking camels than ever before. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel yourself. <laughs> Reverend McKillop, aging, paralyzed, unable to speak, listens helplessly as Philip Gentry, criminal and murderer, explains why he killed Reverend Pierce and assumed Pierce's clothes and identity and describes his first sermon. And so, in conclusion, dear friends, remember the agony of our Lord was shared by two thieves, and they were crucified beside him that he might be numbered among the transgressors. And remember his words to one. Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. <coughs> now we will sing hymn 426, Just as I am without one plea. That was my first sermon, Reverend McKillop. Oh, I saw your eyes when Lucy told you how, how deeply moved the congregation was. Oh, you couldn't understand, you just couldn't, how such a thing could be done without faith. Oh, but, but I've been a lawyer, and, and I've done a lot without faith, yes. I've been the ideal parson you were looking for. I, oh, I wish you could ask young Hubbard. Uh, you don't know he called on me, huh? Reverend Pierce? Yes. I missed your first service, Reverend. I thought I ought to pay you a call. My name's Hubbard. Oh, yes, I know, I know. You're in the choir. Come on. Come in, Mr. Hubbard. Make yourself comfortable. Oh, thank you. What's your business, Mr. Hubbard? Uh, I work at the bank. I'm chief teller. Chief teller? What a very responsible job for a young man like you. I suppose it is, but I don't have much more responsibility than the other tellers, except at the end of the month. Oh. Then it's a strain. End of the month? Why? Well, sure. That's when I have to... Yes? <laughs> You know, I, I've never told anyone about oh, this. Please. And so even with you, well, I... if it's confidential. Please. Well, no, no, naturally not so far as you're concerned, Reverend okay. Pierce. Um, you see, the 30th of the month, we move all our deposits to the Federal Reserve Bank. Yes. Um, $200,000 or more. So you can see how I wouldn't want some people to know that. You mean you, you have to take the deposits alone to... Oh, no, no, gosh, no. That'd be even worse than it is. No, there's an armored truck that oh, comes to wow. take the money. 
Surely the bank takes adequate precautions. I'm well, I have a to... gun and there's an alarm system, but... Oh, you see. Well, the thing is, I'm all alone. Hmm? Sometimes when I'm sitting there at my desk, I think how easy it would be. Why? Well, all somebody would have to do is shoot me through the glass door. <laughs> Even if the alarm rang, it would be ten minutes before the police got there. Well, Mr. Hubbard, after all, it's a very quiet community, no one. Well, I guess that's what the directors of the bank figure. Only possible danger I can see would be from from too many people knowing what you've told me. I mean, wrong people. Mm. You say you don't talk, so... Oh, no. No, Reverend Pierce, I've never told a soul except mm-hmm. you. See, that's faith, McKillop. I, I see I did a lot without faith, but, but not without faith in my own shining destiny. Imagine, out of all this community, 35,000 people, Hubbard, picked me, me, to share his secret. <laughs> he even told me the truck didn't come for the money until 9.30 at night. As soon as Hubbard had gone, I wrote a letter to Mac. You remember, I I told Mac to wait for me in Chicago, and, and in that letter, I explained the setup, and I asked him to be at the bank at 9 p.m. on the 30th. Well, and in the meantime, I, I continued to play my saintly part. <laughs> it was easy, warmed by adulation, warmed by love, yes, love. Because even you could see what was happening to your daughter. Your own very beautiful daughter. Lucy, yes, yeah, she she fell in love with me. <laughs> and believe me, Lucy was a great help to me. Blinded by what she called love. If I made a slip, she was there to help me cover up. And what did I feel? Love? Well, Lucy, as long as the word love served me, I used it. But last week, on Wednesday, when I came in the evening to read to you, I... I suddenly realized that it could also be a source of great danger. Oh, Howard. Howard, darling. Hmm. You're all I've waited for all day. Let me look at you, Lucy. Say you look so happy. Howard, I have the most wonderful news. Guess. How can I guess? Well, I've never breathed a word to Father about us. You and me, you know, because you asked me not to. Not until he can talk to us. I'm sure you didn't. No, not yet I haven't, but... The doctor was here today. Yes? And he told me Father will speak again soon, any day now. Yeah. Doctor doesn't know why he hasn't already. Mm. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Yes, and yes, it is. Howard, what's the matter? Nothing is the matter. Well, there is, I can see. Well, look, Lucian, I was going to tell you before, you see, I can't marry you, not ever. You can? Please, don't ask me why. It's because you don't love me. Believe me, Lucy, you you just have to go on and live your life as as if you'd never met me. As if I'd never met you. You know what that means? Whatever it means. It means I'll marry Tom Hubbard and you'll well, form the service. Yes. You'll be the one to make me Mrs. Tom Hubbard. Mrs. who? Who did you say? Tom Hubbard. I'll be a banker's wife. What? <laughs> never knew his name before. Either. Well, no matter what you think, Lucy, I, I'm sure you'll be happy. <laughs> I have to go in and see your father now, Lucy, and try to be brave, will you? Good evening, Reverend McKillop. Oh, you poor, voiceless, brainless, harmless old Reverend McKillop. I I hear you may be able to talk again, yes. I, I hear someday you're going to speak. Well, I have only one week to wait, that's all, one week, and but you are a danger. Therefore, I ought to kill you, Reverend. I I ought to kill you now. Oh, don't ask me why I didn't kill you, Reverend McKillop. I I suppose it will always be distasteful to me. It's a, it's a job for cruder minds, and and if it happens that my neat habits turn in a good deed now and then, that doesn't make me a Boy Scout, does it? I might not like to think of Lucy, only only two days married, so soon to be a widow, so so soon in half an hour, yes, because in half an hour, Mac is going to shoot Tom Hubbard as he sits at his desk. And in half an hour, I'll have $200,000 and I'll be free, you hear? Well, Reverend, now that you know the real Philip Gentry, do you understand? 
Do you? No, I doubt it. I, I doubt if you, with your good book and, and your years of tending the good sheep in the rich green pastures here, could ever understand one-tenth of what a man like me feels. Doesn't matter. I don't need your understanding. I don't. Good night, Reverend, and, and sleep well. <laughs> Who is it? It's me, Reverend Pierce Town. Oh, let me in. Reverend Pierce, just a minute. Well, I wanted to make sure. You see, this is the night when the truck yes, comes. Yes, yes, I remember. That's how I knew where to find you. Oh. Well, did you want something? Yes. Lucy's feeling sick. I I came to send you home. L- Lucy? But I, I can't. I have to stay. I can stay for you. Oh, gee, I don't know. I'm supposed to stay until the truck Lucy's gets here. Lucy's calling for you, Tom. She's really sick? Yes. Well, all right. I I guess with you here, it'll be all right. Just tell me what to do. Well, uh, that's the money right there already in those sacks. Yes. I sit here? Yeah, right at this desk. And... Mm. Gee, I I don't know what the directors will Come think. Come on, run along, Tom. They'll never know. Even if someone walks by from the outside, they'll never know if it's if it's you or me sitting here. Something's crowy. You said in your letter that... No, no. I, <laughs> I didn't have a chance to tell you the plans were changed. Oh, gentry. Honest gentry. I didn't mean to I shoot. Know. You... Look, you better go. I... I'm dying, man. I, I ain't going to leave you here, gentry. What do you think? Yes, you, you are going to leave me. They won't get me back. I... <laughs> I'm dying. I... You go on now. I... Only... You won't be able to take the money. The yeah. plan is all changed. Yeah, okay, that, that doesn't matter, the, the money. Remember me when, when thou comest into thy kingdom. Hey, hey, what are you talking about, Gentry? It's from the Bible, Mac. You wouldn't know it. Uh, uh, it's from the Bible. Yes. It was said by, by a thief. <laughs> This, dear friends, was the man Philip Gentry, or Reverend Pierce, or whatever other name he may choose in eternity, the man whom we bury today. That night when he stood above my bed, pouring defiance and bitterness into my ears, thinking I was paralyzed, I could both speak and write. My paralysis had been gone for many days, but I did not speak, because I knew what Philip Gentry would do what he had to do. I knew what he denied, that to accomplish work as he had in God's vineyard, a man must have faith, even though he deny that faith. That is why, in spite of all, he protected my daughter's happiness. That is why he could not kill me. For the work he did here had molded him, in spite of himself, into a man who is truly a servant of God. To such a man our Lord would say, Verily I say unto you, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. week, the makers of Camel cigarettes send free camels to servicemen's hospitals from coast to coast. This week, the camels go to Veterans Hospital, Wood, Wisconsin, USAAF Station Hospital, Langley Field, Hampton, Virginia, U.S. Naval Hospital, Memphis, Tennessee, U.S. Marine Hospital, Cleveland, Ohio, and Veterans Hospital, Aspenwall, Pennsylvania. More people are smoking camels than ever before, and many of those people are doctors. 
when three leading independent research organizations asked 113,597 doctors, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand named most was Camel. According to a nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Next week, Mystery in the Air, starring Mr. Peter Lorre, brings you The Mask of Medusa by Nelson Bond, with a special musical score composed and conducted by Paul Barron. Why do you smoke a pipe? For pleasure, of course. Then get the tobacco especially made for smoking pleasure, Prince Albert. Ask for mellow, mild Prince Albert the next time you buy tobacco for your pipe. And the extra pleasure you'll enjoy will tell you why more pipes smoke P.A. than any other tobacco. Prince Albert's choice tobacco is specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Crimp cut to burn slow, smoke cool. Ask for Prince Albert. See if Prince Albert doesn't give you more pipe enjoyment. Listen in on Prince Albert's Grand Ole Opry Saturday night for a half hour of folk music and laughs. With Red Foley and his Cumberland Valley boys, Minnie Pearl, the gossip from Grinder Switch, Rod Brassfield, and the rest of the Opry gang. And as Red's special guests, you'll hear Cowboy Copus and Barefoot Brownie. Remember, Prince Albert's Grand Ole Opry, Saturday night over NBC. <laughs> Listen again next week at this same time when the makers of Camel Cigarettes present Mr. Peter Lorre in Mystery in the Air. The artists supporting Mr. Lorre tonight were Henry Morgan as the voice of mystery, Peggy Weber as Lucy, John Brown as Reverend McKillop, Howard Culver as Mac, Jack Edwards Jr. as Hubbard, and Russell Thorson as Reverend Pierce. This is Michael Roy in Hollywood wishing you a pleasant good night for Camel. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the brushless shaving cream with a special protective film that guards your face, presents the Mole Mystery Theater. Tonight, Mole... The brushless shaving cream, which puts face protection first, brings you another in the series of programs which puts mystery and excitement first. Each Tuesday night at this time, you hear one of the great mystery stories selected either from the famous classics or from the best of the moderns by Mr. Jeffrey Barnes. Mr. Barnes, having made a lifelong study of mystery fiction, is a connoisseur of fine detective stories. Mr. Barnes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Mole Mystery Theater. Tonight's story is unusual in many ways. First, it is an original mystery written especially for radio. Secondly, it is the work of a young man who has never before written a mystery story. The writer is Corporal Frederick Matho. Corporal Matho walked into my office one morning with a script under his arm. I promised him I would read his story. I did. And I got the shock of my life. Here was a first-time effort, and yet, in my opinion, it ranks for the very best in mystery literature. So it is with a great deal of pride that we now present for the first time anywhere a story written by Corporal Frederick Mako entitled The Comic Strip Murder. <laughs> Friends, before our Mole Mystery Theater play begins, listen. Listen to the sound of a weapon fired at our men by the enemy, but aimed by someone here in America who talked too much. Yes, American, when someone here at home talks carelessly, it helps the enemy aim his bombs and guns and other weapons at our men. So don't you be that someone. If you know any war secret that has 
not been reported on the radio or in the newspapers, keep it a mystery and help keep our men alive. And now to our play, The Comet Strip Murder. It is evening. Two people sit on a dimly lighted terrace of a New York penthouse apartment. One is the district attorney. The other a woman who looks tense and frightened. It's 11.30. And my husband's going to murder me at midnight, Mr. Hammond. Tonight? Mrs. That's... You think being married to a comic strip artist has given me an overactive imagination? Well, I thought so, too, when I first went to see you, but not anymore. Look, Mr. Hanley, let me tell you the whole story. These past few weeks, Mark has been drawing Buzz O'Keefe with blood on his pen. My blood. You follow Buzz O'Keefe in the morning telegram, don't you, Mr. Hanley? Mm-hmm. Why, of course, everybody does. You've eaten up his lurid tale, one bloody episode after another. Well, I've lived with that comic strip for nine years. It's been Buzz O'Keefe this and Buzz O'Keefe that until I could scream at the side of a drawing board or a newspaper. Mr. Hanley. No, I'm frightened. Very frightened. You see, Mark's murders are so messy. His fans love blood and pistol shots and poison and spike doors and charred bones and... And that's it. Gee, Alice, look. Buzz O'Keefe locked in the cellar and it's filling with ammonia gas. Uh-huh. And that model, Julia, upstairs in the pantry. Yeah. How's he ever going to save her? Him locked up like that. Times Square? Okay, mister. Say, you read Buzz O'Keefe today? That guy's really in a jam. I think this von Sewell's getting tired of that babe's double time. He's going to kill her yet. Today... Skip it, will you? I read it. Hiya, Bill. What will it be? Toast and coffee? Yeah, and the telegram. Yeah. Why do you read Buzz O'Keefe this morning? I think this von Sewell fella's going to murder that chick, Juliet. He's reading books on flesh-eating acid. If he's going to use that stuff, it's goodbye, Juliet. She ain't going to keep that classic Cassie long. Buzzle Saver. Ah, not this time. Julia, it's a corner. She ought to die. Lots of guys want to kill her. Wouldn't fool around like that. Buzz. 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 Mr. Hanley, I am Juliet in the comic strip. The reason Mark's going to kill me is because of John Slater. See, Mark and John are partners in the O'Keefe Strip. Golly, I remember the night Buzz O'Keefe was created nine years ago. Mark and John hadn't seen each other since they graduated from college the year before. It was our first wedding anniversary, and we were at a small nightclub up town. Well, John, you old bat, it's about time you showed up. That's right, John. We thought you'd never get here. You know, you've been promising to come east for a long time. Took me that long to get over your saying yes to Mark and no to me, (laughs) Julia. Uh, making any progress in the commercial art field, Mark? Well, this freelance business is all right in spots, John, but... But we do all right, John. Oh, I see. Like that, huh? Mark... Why don't you get into a steady line in art? How about newspapers? Political cartoonists do well, or... Or say, why don't you do a comic strip? Good money in it if it catches on. Well, Mark, try that. I guess they don't like a sense of humor. That's who right. said anything about humor? Comic strips aren't funny anymore. Get up a good blood chiller, an adventurer for a leading character. A detective, maybe. A, a guy who's always getting into tough spots and getting out of them again. Crime, the gory, the bitter. Well, it's an idea. Look, look, Mark. Do me something to show around. About a week's trips. The balance of the story and outline. I'll sell it for you, Mark. What do you think? Well, why not? Uh, I, I think a detective would suit me best, though. Should have an Irish name. 
I want to see him. Brian, a key. Oh, key. Oh, key. That's, key. That's good. Oh, look. How about calling him Buzz? You know, sort of a busy sounding name. Buzz yeah. O'Keefe. Buzz O'Keefe. Yes, Buzz O'Keefe is swell. Uh, waiter. Yes, sir. Bring us another round. We're going to drink to Buzz O'Keefe. Who? Never mind. You'll know him soon enough. <laughs> And that's how Buzz O'Keefe was born, Mr. Hadley. John Slater and my husband, Mark, became partners. John is a promotion man and business manager. Perfect success story, hmm? Not quite. There were lots of things we didn't figure on. Mark worked hard and late to meet newspaper deadlines. He never went anywhere. I worked hard with him, I guess. I modeled red twins, did research work and crime. We thought that the strip would let us lead a normal life after we got it going. Well, it didn't work out. Then, John Slater began taking me off. Oh, it was Mark's idea. He brought it up that afternoon. John dropped into the studio about... about two years ago. He discussed it. Hello, Drudges. What's buzzing today? Drudge is right. I'm in a mess here. Mm-hmm. Another O'Keefe is... He, he's on the top of a building holding onto a high tension wire, and Concrete Head Joe is cutting the wires. And, what and I... I'm rooting for Concrete Head Joe. <laughs> How are you, John? Hello, well, Julia. Uh, just dropped in to tell you about the new five year contract I've got for us. How about celebrating? Oh, I can't, John. Too much to do. But say, Julie's tired of working. Do her good to step out. Why don't you two celebrate? Good hunch. How about it, Julia? Well, the idea's pretty appealing. It's... If you really don't mind, Mark. No, no, not at all. Run along and have some fun. That should never have happened, Mr. Hanley. You see, I thought John Slater was over his crush on me, but I guess he wasn't. And I guess I... I realized, too, that I was sick of Buzz O'Keefe and what he had done to nine years of my life. And that I was sick of Mark, too. Well, one night about four months ago, while we were at a cocktail party, Mark came out into the garden and he he found me in John Slater's arms. There was no scene. Oh, not then. We didn't talk at all until later in the car on the way home. I knew Mark had been drinking heavily, but he seemed sober to me. Finally, I couldn't stand his silence, and I said something I'd been meaning to say for a long time. Mark. Mark, I want you to divorce me. Mm-mm. Out of the question, Julie, darling. I need you near me for a while. It's more convenient. You see, I may want to kill you. Mark! Yes, Julie, kill you. This is what kind of a fool you take me for. Don't you think I know that that leech Slater is taking away from me? I do all the work. He gets the same royalties I do. And now it's you he's taking. Or has taken... Mark! Mark, you're drunk. Not that drunk, darling. Not that drunk. <laughs> I didn't close my eyes that night. I, I wanted to wake Mark to hear him say something that would assure me that he hadn't said what I knew he said. Well, the next morning, Mark came down to the studio in his robe, as he always did. He, he seemed quite normal. Good ah, morning. Good morning. Hmm. Wonderful day and all that. Good night's sleep. Uh, how about my morning cup of coffee, darling? Mark. Mark, last night we... Hmm, last night? Oh, last night. Yeah. Quite a ball we had, wasn't it, huh? I remember parts of it, like spilling the Manhattan all over Mrs. Drew or Droop or whatever her name was. And then there was... And then there was the drive home. Huh? Drive home? What about it? Oh, now, don't tell me I was feeding you. Great, Scott, won't I ever learn? Mark! Yes, Julia. Nothing. Here's your coffee. Thanks. Now, you run along. Let me work. Oh, before you go, there's something you can tell me that will help. If you were a beautiful model named Juliet, you were going to be murdered. What would be the most horrible fate you could come to? That was the beginning. 
beginning, Mr. Hanley. First, I thought he was really planning a murder for his cartoon detective to solve. And then... Well, one night we went to a reception a publisher gave for Jim Tull, the mystery novelist. While I was dancing, Mark and Tull sat down and began to talk. When I came back, they were sitting in an alcove and they were deep in conversation. They didn't notice me as I stood close enough to hear them. You mean to tell me you haven't yet figured out a way to murder your character, Julie, yet, Mark? Well, I have some ideas, but none of them quite satisfy me, Jim. You see, there's so many ways to kill a beautiful woman. And the man who's going to do it hates her. Uh, I thought you might have a suggestion. Why murder her, then? She's so proud of her beauty, so so arrogant. Well, wouldn't it be a more fitting revenge for your murderer to maim her, disfigure her? I've considered that. And it is the best. But for my purpose, she must be killed. Maybe I can do both. Why not? You've created a shallow, treacherous beauty. Your readers will relish seeing her beauty destroyed before she dies. Jim, I think you've got something there. That's what I'll do. Or I'll draw, rather. I... I think I can do both by using a bath of flesh-eating acid. <laughs> I can just see the murderer. Oh, heaven, Julie! Julie, darling, are you all right? Well, what happened? Well, what happened? It was the next day that I first came to see you, Mr. Hanley. After I left you that day, I... I came back to the apartment to find Mark working feverishly at his table. I stood behind him as his long, slender fingers brushed in the chair. Mark? Hmm? Mark, why did you model your Juliet's apartment and her terrace after ours? Why should I draw one from imagination when I have a perfectly good one to here? Makes it easier, that's all. You were even putting in our fish pot. Very observant of you, my dear. Yep, I've got good use for that little item. Oh? Have you noticed the size and shape of our fish pot? Well, I... No? Well, I measured it the other day. It's five and a half feet long, two feet wide, and eighteen inches deep. Mark, you can't mean... Ah, but I do. The perfect coffin. <laughs> And by the way, Junior, in tomorrow's episode, a two-gallon drum of acid. Ed, put that paper down and eat your breakfast. Yeah, 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 sure. Gosh, looks as though Bud O'Keefe is going to have a murder to solve soon. I'm sure find the acid today. Ed! Okay, okay, I'm eating eight eyes. Sam, with thanks and glasses to the ceiling, you're sitting reading the newspaper. Oh, what? I first got to finish with Buzz O'Keefe. Hmm. Acid Von Sul is fine today. And for my tailor yet, just like to me, he was coming. Okay, Mrs. Jones, uh, ready for your permanent now. Oh, <laughs> you're reading Buzz O'Keefe. Ain't it something? All Juliet's boyfriends are murder movies. And the yes is, well, isn't it just too horrible? <laughs> She's going to get it. What can you see? I said five gallons of it. I bet it's going to be in the fish pond. Right. Horrible, ain't it? <laughs> hey, look at this. No, Tom. Buzz O'Saver. Buzz O'Keefe. Buzz Buzz. 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 as though Julia is right. Seems as if things that happen in Mark's comic strip are mighty apt to happen to her in real life. Yet, of course, it could be just coincidence. Mm, that reminds me of a friend of mine who was always blaming things on coincidence. For instance, he'd always nick and irritate his face while shaving. Then he changed to mole and started getting swell shaves. He said, oh, that's just a lucky coincidence. But I noticed that he kept on using mole, and he kept on getting smooth, comfortable shaves. And gentlemen, this is why. Mole brushless shaving cream contains a special protective film. 
This special film helps guard your skin against tiny, almost invisible nicks and scrapes that make your shaves uncomfortable. As a result, you get a really pleasant, comfortable shave every morning. So why not try it tomorrow? Remember to ask for Mole. The brushless shaving cream that puts face protection first. And now back to Jeffrey Barnes and Act Two of the comic strip Murder. Julia Stetson sits in her penthouse apartment telling the district attorney about her husband's plan to kill her. Kill her precisely as he plans to kill his comic strip character, Julian. Kill her by submerging her in a large fish pond filled with deadly acid. As you say, Mr. Hanley, Mark isn't well mentally. If it hadn't been for you, I'd have run away long ago. Well, after Van Sue, the comic strip character, brought the acid, Mark did the same thing. When I asked him about it, he only laughed at me. He showed me the label and said it was dry cleaning fluid he bought from a tailor. He was going to clean the upholstery of the car himself. But Mr. Hanley, his contents are in the fish pond right now. Look. Today, this morning, I had an attack of hay fever, so I came down to the studio later than you. Mark seems very late. Well, this is the day, Julia. The comic strip murder's finished. I've got the actual murder taking place in three days of stretch. I've had them done for some time, but I've hidden them. You hidden them? Yes. But since I'm throwing them in this noon, I think it's only fair for you to see the fate of poor Julia. So here, take a look. But, Mark, this man... That... You see, it wasn't you who sent the acid-filled wine bottle. It was a new character. Well, her husband. <gasps> yes, looks a little like me, doesn't he? He's been watching her. Hating her. See how horrified Juliet is. Look at the wonderful expression I got on her face in this panel. When her husband takes the hypodermic needle out of his pocket. Good, hmm? And look at the action in these panels. See? He grabs her arm here and she starts to scream, but he gags her with his hand and plunges the needle into her neck. See? It's horrible. That needle in her neck. Uh, and here, the final touch. Masterpiece of ten. Her husband kisses her gently on the forehead before putting on his rubber gloves. See? Here? And then he lowers her gently into the fish pond. And she can't move a finger to stop him. But do you? You're trembling. I've never seen you so interested, so affected. Oh, should I take these away? Maybe you'd rather not see them. No, no, I... I mean, yes, I I want to see them. Good. The last panel's the best. We show Juliet's husband calmly smoking a cigarette as he looks with a big smile on his lips. What's going on in the fish pond? Of course, we can't show that. But you can imagine... Thank you, darling. Mark finally left Mr. Hanley. But his last words to me were, I'll be back late, darling, around midnight sometime. You'll be here, won't you? That's the story in every detail I can remember. I see. Mr. Hanley, Mark's going to be here any minute now, and I know. I know he's going to try to kill me because... Well, tonight's the night Juliet, the girl on the comic strip, is going to be killed. Mm. I'm frightened, Mr. Hanley. I'm frightened something will go wrong with our plan. Mr. Hanley, you won't let him out. I mean, he won't have time to... No, no, no. No, Mrs. Stetson. He won't have time to murder you. I'll be behind the screen every second. At any rate, if something does go wrong and he reaches you before I have time to interfere, use this revolver and use it quick. All right. And I understand at the far end of the terrace. Yes, as far away from the fish pond as you can. It's 12. You better... No, no, no. Don't worry about a thing, Mrs. Benson. I'll be behind the screen. Mr. 
Where are you? On the terrace, Mark. Oh, I knew you'd be waiting. Well, let's get our first ritual over with. Then I've got a real surprise for you. Where's that? Mark, Mark, what are you going to do? What's that needle for, Mark? Well, now, really, Julia, dear, after all, this can't be news to you. We've gone over it before. You should be past being frightened by now. Take it in your heart. No, no, Mark, no. Well, stop squirming. No. It won't hurt. That's why I'm doing it. No, no, no. You're trying to kill me. No, no, let me go. Let me go. Let me go. Julia. Julia, you fool. Give me that gun. Let's go. All right, Mr. Stetson. They were blank cartridges. Mrs. Stetson, I arrest you for the attempted murder of your husband. What did you say? You can drop it now, Mrs. Stetson. It's curtain time. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, you saw him try to use that needle on me. It's for a poison or a drug, you saw it. Yes, poison you put into it this afternoon. Poison you put into your own hypodermic needle. Oh, we know your husband has been giving you injections for hay fever. What about the acid? You and John Slater bought that acid, not your husband, Mrs. Stetson. You and Slater had motives for killing Mark, so he wouldn't give you a divorce to marry Slater, so with Mark dead, Slater would get your husband's royalties from the Buzz O'Keefe strip. And the plot for the entire Juliet secret. That, that's why she gave me that. She gave me that story. Why, I, I, I thought it was such a good story, too. But she was leading to this crime. You, 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 listen. The most ingenious part of the whole thing was calling me in on the case. If I believed the story she had just got through weaving for me, and if she had shot you, it would have been a clear case of self-defense with the district attorney as her star witness. But they always slip up somewhere. What do you mean? How? You forget that today was your wedding anniversary. No! So I was lucky enough to find that out. Mrs. Stetson, a man who is going to murder his wife, doesn't arrange a surprise party for her at midnight. He... Mrs. Stetson, come back here. Stay away from that parapet. Julia, don't climb over. You'll fall. Come back. No, nothing, Julia. If you don't like it, come and get me. Stanley, stop her. She's trying to walk along the ledge and then escape with the fire escape. Oh, good Lord. It's 50 stories down. She's mad. Julia, look out. Julia, you're going to... Look out. Good heavens. Julia. Julia. Oh, good Lord. Mark, go to a hotel for the night. I'll get in touch with you in the morning. The, the bell. I'll... Uh, I am I am well, what is this? <laughs> you forgotten? Come on, everybody. All together. Happy wedding anniversary! Oh. Yes. Happy wedding anniversary. <laughs> and so, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end of tonight's exciting Mole Mystery Theater presentation of The Comic Strip Murder. Mr. Watson, funny. Oh, boy, what a comic strip. It's called The Little Shaver. <laughs> it's all about this guy who makes it straight his face while shaving every day. <laughs> oh, is that funny? Well, it sounds very funny. Uh, what's <laughs> happening in the strip today? <laughs> well, here's where he dreads to begin his shave. <laughs> Here's where he nicks his belt. Well, say, why doesn't someone tell him about Mole? <laughs> that spoil the comic strip. <laughs> well, then there wouldn't be any problems. No problems, no comic strip. <laughs> well, friends, it's true. Mole does put an end to shaving problems. Mole helps guard your face from irritating little nicks and scrapes because it puts face protection first. Because, you see, Mole's special film has more real body and substance than light fluffy cream... It gives your razor something to ride on. And then, also, Mole's special film contains a blend of beard-softening ingredients and non-irritating oils that are actually of medical purity. Mole is made of official United States pharmacopoeia ingredients, the same as used to fill doctors' prescriptions. Yes, in every way, face protection comes first when you use Mole. So your first Mole shave is really pleasant. 
And day after day, as that special film helps guard your skin, your shaves get better, better, and better. When you shave with M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the brushless shaving cream that puts face protection first. And now once again, Jeffrey Barnes to tell you about the Mole Mystery Theater play for next week. For next week, ladies and gentlemen, I have chosen a classic short story of suspense and murder by the eminent W.W. Jacobs. It is entitled, The Interruption. So, mystery fans, we invite you to be with us next week for an ingenious tale when you will learn the secret behind The Interruption. Original music for the Mole Mystery Theater is composed and conducted by Jack Miller. The comic strip murder was written by Corporal Frederick Nathal. Until next Tuesday, this is Dan Seymour saying good night and good shaving with Mole. The brushless shaving cream that puts face protection first. <laughs> Every day, thousands of men and women supplement their diet with IY, ironized yeast tablets. Is your diet deficient in iron? Do you need more vitamin B1? IY tablets give you extra iron to help build rich red blood. Extra vitamin B1 to help keep nerves steady, help you maintain pep and strength. To help keep vigor and vitality, take ironized yeast. They're small, easy-to-swallow tablets. Insist on IY, ironized yeast tablets. This is the National Broadcasting Company. is darkest, our fears the strongest, our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The Secret of XR3. Midnight. Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Max Ehrlich is The Secret of XR3. The Death House. A man sits in a tiny cell, his head bowed, waiting for the moment when he will pass from light to eternal shadow. The clock ticks on, but the time is not yet, not quite yet. Then footsteps sound in the corridor. The door opens. It's almost time, my son. Yes, Father. I know. Is there anything I can do? No. Still, I'm glad you've come. Father, uh, look at me. Look at me closely. Yes? I frighten you, don't I? I terrify you. No. No, my son. Nothing frightens me except the evil in men's hearts. Am I evil? I... 
I don't know, my son. Oh, father, I... Uh, sit down. Let me tell you my story. And then when I've finished, perhaps you can tell me. They call me Gorgo. All my life I've been a little man, only three feet high. Perfectly normal in every way, you see, except for my height. Perhaps you saw me down at the Century Theater not so long ago, the vaudeville team of Petrov and Gorgo, acrobats supreme. Petrov was a huge, ape-like man who tossed me through the air like a rubber ball. The audience liked the act. The contrast between the big, big Petrov and the little, little Gorgo intrigued and amused them. And on the stage, I, I laughed and smiled and went through my tricks like a happy little fellow. But in the dressing room, it was different. I did not like your performance tonight, Gorgo. But, but uh, what, what was wrong with the Petrov? You were slow. You landed too heavily. You did not smile enough. Yeah, but they liked this, Petrov. You heard them. We got three curtain calls. We should have gotten five. Petrov, I, I did my best. My very best. Believe me, Your I... best was not good enough, little one. Perhaps you will do better tomorrow. If I lock you in your room tonight without supper. That was Vladimir Petrov. A gorilla of a man and master of my body and soul. How I hated him. How many times I, I wept in the silence of my room. All my life I had walked in the shadows of bigger people. See, all my life I had looked up instead of straight ahead. Endured the stares of the curious and sensed the pity that was in their hearts. And that was why I used to wait in the alley near the stage door between performances, because it was dark there. I loved the dark. It protected me and hid me from those who stared and mocked. One night... I beg your pardon, you were Gorgo? Yes. Uh, my name is Dr. Mead. I saw your performance earlier tonight. I was just coming in to see you. Yes? What about I happen to be an expert in glandular work, particularly in the function of the pituitary or growth gland. I think the results of my recent experiments will interest you. I, uh, I don't understand, Dr. Mead. Did you ever hear of XR3? XR3? No. Well, it's an extract, a uh, synthetic, I discovered about two years ago. In my experiments to date, whenever I injected it into stunted or dwarfed animals, they grew. They grew? Yes. You, you mean to normal size? Well, by using controlled doses, yes. You mean if you could do this with, with animals, then, then you could... I don't know, Gorgo. I think the time has come to try. Except for your size, you were perfectly formed. Just what I've been looking for. I came to ask you if you'd volunteer. Yes, yes. You understand I can't guarantee a thing. I understand, and, and that doesn't matter. I... Dr. Mead, you don't know what it means, even the chance, a chance to grow to normal size. Why, uh, I... One thing, though, I must have your written permission. My permission? Yes, yes, Dr. Mead, I'll give it to you gladly. I'll do anything, anything. You speak a little hastily, do you uh, not, Gorgo? Petrov. Yes, little one. I'm sorry, Dr. Mead. I'm afraid you will have to find someone else for your experiments. Someone else? My little friend cannot act as your guinea pig without my consent. You see, I am Gorgo's legal guardian. And I have the papers to prove it. No, Petrov, no! No, you've got to give me this chance! Silence, little fool! As I said, I am sorry, Doctor, but... But, my dear sir, if I can make Gorgo grow to normal size... If you did, what would become of our act? It would be worthless. The people come to see big Petrov and little Gorgo. Do you mean to say, Mr. Petrov, that you would let your vaudeville act stand in the way? Yes. I spent years building the team of Petrov and Gorgo. You think I am going to let you ruin my investment now? Petrov, please, please, please let him do it. You've got Shut to. Shut up, you little fool, and get inside. Petrov! As for you, doctor, I wouldn't advise you to come around here again. <laughs> This was a blow I could not stand. Dr. Mead had opened a prison door for me and Petrov had slammed it shut again. I resolved then that come what may, I would have my chance. 
The very idea of the XR3, of becoming a man like other men, made me drunk and gave me daring. One morning, while Petrov was away, I paid a visit to Dr. Mead at his office and begged him to try the experiment without Petrov's permission. I'm sorry, Gogo, but I cannot. The experiment would be very delicate if anything should happen without your guardian's legal permission. No, I'll run the risk, Dr. Mead. I'll be glad to. I'm sorry, but it can't be done. I see. Dr. Mead. Yes? Just what does this XR3 look like? Well, I read it up in capsule form. Here, I have a whole bottle of the capsules in my desk drawer. As you see, they're green in color. So those are the magic capsules. Thank you for letting me see them, Doctor. Thank you very much. Late that night, I slipped out of my hotel room and down the fire escape. Keeping in the shadows, I went to Dr. Mead's office and climbed through the grilled bars in the window. It was easy for a man of my size. And when I left, I had the bottle of XR3 capsules in my pocket. Well, that was Saturday night. I took one capsule and then another. They made me ill, lightheaded. Then I fell into a deep sleep. And then a knock on the door wakened me. Uh, 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 who is it? Petro. <laughs> Are you sleeping so late? Uh, uh, I don't feel well. Ah, my little one does not feel well. What a pity. Please, uh, uh, Petrov, I want to sleep. Very well. Today is Sunday and there is no performance. But tomorrow, my little Gorgo, you had better be in the best of health, understand? Otherwise, I'll see that you really become sick. After he left, I fell into the deep sleep again. And then something woke me. My muscles ached as though I had been stretched on a rack. There was daylight again. It was Monday. My pajamas seemed uncomfortably tight, and I looked down, and the sleeves only reached my elbows. I stared, and my heart stopped beating. Then I remembered the XR3. Like a drunken man, I staggered over to the mirror, looked. Yes! I had grown. I had grown. My pajamas were stretched to bursting. I was growing. I was at least five feet tall. Five feet tall! It was almost time for the performance now. Petrov would be coming for me any minute. And I didn't want him to see me. Not yet. So I piled furniture against the door. And waited. All right, Gorgo. Time to go to the theater. I, uh... I can't go, Petrov. Not tonight. I'm still sick. What? You little swine, do you think I'm going to postpone the performance because you're sick? Open the door. No. Petrov, no. Don't come in. Don't come in. You little fool. I'll break every bone in your body. I heard the key, and I heard it turning in the lock. The furniture against the door would only hold for a minute, and I ran to my valise, took out a straight razor, and then, like a frightened animal... My little... Gorgo. In the name of heaven, what... Yes, Petrov. I got it. I stole the XR-3, and I took it. Now, you see... You idiot. Do you realize what you've done? You've ruined the act. You've ruined it, do you hear? Yes, but I'm a man now. I'm a man, not a dwarf. They won't stare at me now. They won't... No? That's what you think. If that doctor could make you grow... He can make you small again. <laughs> Smaller than ever. No, Petrov, no! Yes, Gorgo. Huh? You've grown, but not so much that I can't handle you. We're going to see him right now. <laughs> Petrov, no! Le- let me alone, for heaven's sake! Oh, struggle, <laughs> you... I'll... Raise him! No! No! <sighs> I told you to leave me alone. I told you. And now it's all over. We've played our last performance together, Petrov. 
a doomed man sitting in the death house pauses in his story, recalling the first time the clock struck 12 for murder at midnight. <laughs> Continuing his story to the priest in the death house. I stayed in my hotel room another day and took two more XR3 capsules. And when I looked into the mirror that night, I was over six feet tall. That was enough. That was all I wanted. Now I would leave the hotel. They'd never know who killed Petrov. They'd be looking for Gorgo, a three-foot midget. Never suspect me. Yes, I was in the clear. I stripped Petrov, put on his clothes. They were a little tight, but they did well enough. Then I went through the lobby and into the night. The mere experience of walking was exciting, exhilarating, as though I were walking on a high fence. And nobody looked at me twice. The staring eyes were gone. I was normal, normal. First, I had to find a place to live. I passed by a boarding house with a sign, Room to Let. I rang the bell. Yeah, what is it? Oh, hello. Hello. I, uh, my name is Baker, John Baker. I, uh, saw your sign about a room. Hmm. Yeah. Well, would you like to see it, big boy? If you don't mind. I don't mind a bit. Come in. Come in. <laughs> It's a lovely room. We got a nice class of people. <laughs> I'm sure you'll like it. I'm sure I will. Uh, but uh, first, Miss... Um... Devlin. Rhoda Devlin. Yeah, I... Uh, well, uh, Miss Devlin, I just wanted to say I've been living in hotels all my life, and I can't give you any references. Forget it. My mother owns the place, and... Well, we're not exactly formal. Besides... You look good to me. I do? Yeah. I... Well, I always did go for big men. Big? Yeah. Oh. Mm. And I, uh... I've always liked pretty girls. Mm. This was a dream come true. I was a normal man. And a normal little girl was attracted to me. She was blonde and blue-eyed, and her head came up to my shoulder. A week passed. A week that was beyond my wildest dreams. I took Rhoda out, and we went everywhere. I fell in love with her. Madly in love. She was so small, so delicate, I... I, I wanted to protect her always. She had opened up a new and magic world to me, a world of light and love and laughter. And then, one night it happened. I was taking Rhoda home from the movies, and we were passing a billiard parlor, and there were several idlers in front of the place. They began saying things. Hey, look at the giant! Yeah. How's the weather up there, big boy? Hey, Jerry, what do you got there, Pike's <laughs> Peak? You wait here, Rhoda. I'll shut their mouths for them. All right. I crack the skull of the next man who opens his mouth. Please. Please, Johnny, don't bother with them. Yeah, but they're saying... I know, but don't mind them. Let's keep walking. No, I Please. will Please. Yeah. All right. Well, what do you know, the big baboon? Trying to throw his weight around. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to smash their jeering faces, knock them down. But Rhoda and I walked on to her mother's boarding house. And she was strangely silent as we entered the dimly lit foyer. She hadn't said a single word since we had passed that billiard parlor. And I was vaguely disturbed. I took her in my arms, but she pushed me away. Oh, no, please don't. What's the matter, I, baby? I, I, Is it what those men at the billiard parlor said? I don't know. It seems to me you're growing... Bigger. Right before my eyes. Growing bigger? Yeah. 
Yeah, I thought at first I was seeing things, but now I know it's true. I know it's crazy, it's crazy, but when we first met, the top of my head reached your shoulders. And now, now... Yeah, what about now? Now it doesn't reach your shoulders anymore. You've grown bigger. Now, Rhoda, you don't know what you're saying. This is your imagination. No, no, it's true. We'd better not see each other anymore. I'm afraid of you, John. You're too big now. Good night. No, Rhoda, listen. Oh, don't no, Rhoda, me. please. Oh, let go of my arm. No, not until you hear what I have to say. Rhoda, I love you. Do you hear? I love you, and I'm not going to let you just toss me aside. Oh, let me go, no. you big luck. Let me oh, go. Stop that. No, stop that screaming. You want to waste the whole street up. No, no. Stop it. Stop it. body sagged in my arms. I'd forgotten my own strength. And in my fury, I'd strangled her. Like a man in a dream, I lowered her body gently to the floor and then turned to look at my reflection in the full-length mirror in the foyer. Yes! Yes, it was true. The pitiless mirror reflected a giant. I'd grown at least six inches. The XR3 had continued its work, was making me grow even now. Now I was a freak again. They stared at me again and pity me. The beautiful, normal world I had so briefly enjoyed came crashing down over my ears. I ran out of the house like a wild man and into the street. Dr. Mead, yes, I had to see him. At once, I ran to his office, avoiding the well-lit streets, and the light was on. I prayed that he was in. I knocked on the door. Yes, what? Good Lord. Hello, Dr. Mead. You remember me? Why? No, I can't say that I do. Look up into my face, Doctor. The features are the same you looked down upon not so long ago. Go, go, the midget. No, Dr. Mead. It's Gorgo the Giant now. So it was you who stole the bottle of XR3 capsules from my desk? Yes, yes, yes. And this is the result? This and Petrov's murder? He deserved to die. It does not alter the fact that it still was murder. Dr. Maid! I'm not here to argue law with you. I want you to save me. You've got to stop this growing process. But how? What can I do? An antidote. You must have an antidote. I'm sorry, but I haven't. There just isn't any. What? No antidote? Oh, you're lying. I assure you, I'm telling the truth, Corgo. I was interested in making things grow, not making them smaller. Yeah. Then I'm lost. There's no way out. I'm sorry. All my life, I was a little man. I wanted to know what it was... what it was like to be a big man. Now I am big. Too big. (laughs) <laughs> Isn't that amusing, Doctor? <laughs> too little and then too big. <laughs> like the swing of a pendulum. <laughs> I wish I were little again. As I knew what to expect then. <laughs> I was used to that. Now they'll stare at me again. They'll laugh and jeer at me. Gorgo the giant. <laughs> Gorgo the giant. <laughs> I think we'd better call the police, Gorgo. <laughs> When 
Well, Father, that's... That's my story. See, that's why I'm here in the death house. Now, tell me, am I evil? No, my son. You have been unfortunate, but not evil. You have sinned, yes. But you have been sinned against, too. And they're coming for you, Gorgo. I hear and I'm glad. Glad? Yes. Glad. I don't mind dying now. This world, Father, what has it ever meant to me? But there, in the next world, there no man will be strange and all will be equal. And perhaps there I will find peace. With firm and measured tread, the man who was first too small and then too big walks down the corridor. And the iron doors along the way rattle and clang like the chiming of the clock when it first struck twelve for murder at midnight. Remember to be with us again when death walks through the darkness with giant strides and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Gorgo was played by Carl Swenson. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leder. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio